it's being recorded. All right, participants are coming in. We'll let this fill up for a minute. It looks like it's, it's, yeah, it's growing. Hello, Enrique. Hey there. Hey, so we're just letting the uh, attendees uh, gather here. It's still growing 71, 72. Awesome, very, very cool. Um, but it, it looks like everything, everything's working well. Or yep. is that the case? Yep. Yeah, we're live. We're live here. So everyone should be able to see us, hear us. Uh, chat is live. And um, once the attendees list stabilizes here uh, at a number, um, I think we'll kick it off. But it looks like somehow Zoom, yeah, maybe they're, they're joining live or maybe Zoom sort of brings them in gradually. Um, okay, brilliant. I'll, I'll jump out then. It's going to be an awesome workshop. And uh, cool. I'll see you later. Thanks, Itel. Thanks a lot. Bye. -bye. Bye. We are approaching 90 people. All right, so Give it another minute or so, and then and we'll kick it off. Looks like it's starting to slow down here, 95. Daniel Norman, should we get anything prepared? All right, well, we're gonna talk about it in a sec, but uh, since you asked, I might as well throw in the repo link here. So this is the repo. I threw, threw it in chat, everyone. There's a repo link. Uh, we'll, talk, we'll talk about it more in a second, but uh, that's kind of a, the entry point here for the workshop. All right, still 95. So this looks this looks like pretty stable to me. Uh, we're going to kick it off, and uh, and people will come in as they come in from here. But uh, but I think we're ready to go. So hey everyone, um, <laughs> welcome to Prisma Day 2020. Uh, this is the second workshop of Prisma Day. So I hope some of you were able to attend the one earlier today. Hope it, heard it was awesome. Um, in this workshop, we're going to be building a little blog API together using Nexus, uh, and in doing so, get a hands-on appreciation for what Nexus is about, um, how you can use it, and uh, yep. Um, so yeah, thanks for coming. Uh, we're really excited to get into this. It's our first time we're running a workshop like this for Nexus, so no guarantees that uh, there won't be any hiccups, but uh, no matter, it should be really a lot of fun. Awesome. So your host today, uh, myself, Jason, and my colleague, Flavio. Uh, we work at Prisma on the Nexus framework and the Prisma plugin. A few ground rules uh, and notes. So uh, first off, uh, just please adhere to the uh, Prisma Day Code of Conduct. It only takes uh, a moment. So please check it out if you haven't already. Uh, the link should have been in the pre-workshop uh, email. But in case you did miss it, um, here it is again. Uh, in chat, just send the link. So uh, anyway, we're sure there won't be any violations and, and so on and so forth. But um, if there are, we'll have to ask you to leave. Uh, uh, but yeah, I'm sure it's going to be awesome. So thanks for your cooperation. Uh, second, um, please be advised that the workshop will be recorded, is being recorded. So any uh, public messages, uh, for example, sent over chat will be part of that recorded content. Um, third, uh, please use the Zoom Q&A tool to submit questions. Uh, this is going to be really helpful. Uh, it allows uh, all of you to upvote the ones most interesting to you. Allows us to triage them, make sure that uh, we've yeah answered ones will move out of the list, stuff like that. So it's gonna be really useful. Um, this is something you should see in your um, little panel of uh, uh, buttons. Uh, there should be a Q and A one that you can see. Um, 
Next, uh, please ensure, so when you send Zoom messages, um, sometimes uh, you might not notice that it's set to all panelists, but not all panelists and attendees. So um, that's probably not what you want. Uh, please set it to all panelists and attendees. That way we can all see uh, not so much your question, because again, that should go in the Q&A, but, but maybe just comments and stuff like that. Um, uh, generally, yeah, just make sure it's set to all panelists and attendees when speaking with us. Uh, finally, uh, tweets are always welcome. So if you're live tweeting or, or want to do a shout out, awesome. Uh, you can hashtag it Prisma Day, and that would be great. Um, so before we get started here into the workshop proper, we're just going to go through a few slides to introduce Nexus and give you kind of high level perspective. Um, first of all, where did Nexus come from? So in 2018, Tim Greaser, uh, technical director at Cypress, uh, released a Node.js library to build GraphQL schemas in code uh, in a type safe way when paired with TypeScript. So his motivation um, came from sort of a lot of real world experience. He had difficulty scaling the schema first approach in some of his projects. And he also worked in uh, a few other programming uh, language communities, uh, Python and Ruby. So he was exposed to how these uh, languages approached uh, building GraphQL APIs. And uh, primarily in those communities, uh, it was code first. So this was Python, Ruby. Um, and he, so he got exposed to these different points of view and uh, brought some of that experience back into this library that he had built. Uh, around the same time, uh, Johannes, uh, founder, co-founder of uh, GraphQL and uh, Prisma, uh, met with Tim at GraphQL Summit. And so Johannes uh, was able to sort of get a sense uh, already, like he already sort of understood the problems because he was working on similar ones at Prisma. Um, Flavion had uh, at around that time released a library uh, working with Johannes and, and Prisma called GraphQL Gen, which was solving similar problems. Uh, the namely problems around having your GraphQL resolvers in your code base be type safe. So at the time, GraphQL Gen was doing this in still a schema first way, but Johannes uh, seeing Tim's work saw that this actually, this direction of the code first approach in his library looked really good. So, um, Johannes, yeah, got, got sort of Prisma behind this uh, approach, got him, uh, got Prisma behind uh, the tool, uh, gave it a name, gave it a logo. Um, that was when sort of Nexus uh, was first, first appeared as a name. And there was some uh, articles that Prisma started publishing about the code first approach. Um, in particular, Nicholas Burke, uh, one of uh, uh, my colleagues uh, at Prisma, uh, wrote a great series um, on the code first approach. And I just posted the link to that. Um, just posted the link for that uh, in chat. Um, and Flavia also throughout this time in early 2019 uh, actually released the first Nexus Prisma plugin as well, building on top of uh, what Nexus provided. So over the course of 2019, uh, the community grew, um, but it also became clear that the barrier to entry wasn't quite as low as, uh, especially for like getting the, the, the workflow going with Nexus wasn't quite as low as we would hope. Um, and it also didn't sort of solve the overall problems of building a GraphQL, GraphQL API completely. So there were still a lot of uh, things you needed to do and, and get right to, to um, ship something to production. Um, so toward the end of 2019, uh, the newly formed Prisma Labs team, uh, Flavia and I, uh, we took on some of these problems in the form of a prototype uh, and explored what a solution could look like. And so this was codenamed Pumpkins. And we came out of 2019 with something that uh, actually looked it's like pretty interesting. It was a GraphQL framework. And uh, it wasn't, yeah, it wasn't a complete uh, disaster. It looked pretty good. It looked like there was a lot of promise. So we continued to invest in that. Uh, we subsumed the Nexus name with that and have been uh, throughout this year continuing to iterate on that. Uh, pretty much a release every two weeks and continuing to refine it uh, to a point where it's in a usable state and not no longer just a very unstable prototype. So it's really awesome to have you all here today to check out the last uh, uh, several months of work actually um, that's been focused around this area. Oh, and one quick shout out. For any users that may have uh, played with or heard about Yoga 2, uh, which was a project that sort of preceded uh, this Pumpkins prototype, but spiritually uh, did play a little bit on the same themes and goals. Uh, you, can, yeah, you can think of, of Nexus uh, framework as sort of being a, a spiritual successor to Yoga 2. Um, but if you don't know what Yoga 2 is, no problem, but, uh, but just a little shout out there. So what is Nexus then today? 
Um, it's two things really from a user perspective. It's an API and it's a CLI. So the API part is focused on getting you the features you need to build your fully featured GraphQL API. The CLI parts are a set of commands for your daily workflows. So there's, uh, well, we'll see that in a sec actually. So first the API. The uh, API is gonna be helping you with things like building a GraphQL schema, building a database schema, mapping the database schema to the GraphQL schema, generating uh, CRUD, so uh, operations for your API clients to run, delete things, update things, create things, stuff like that. Uh, query your database in a type safe way from your resolvers. Manage your application configuration, log structured data, manage your HTTP server if you have one, because um, there's a serverless kind of uh, direction here as well. Uh, and system test your GraphQL API. So there's more going on, of course, but this is sort of a bucket list of some sort of big areas of the API. Uh, the CLI uh, primarily has these two commands, uh, Nexus Dev for watching and recompiling your API on every change. Uh, and it has some rich interactivity uh, features such as database migration prompts and uh, managed TS config settings. So if you go off the hacky path, for example, in a TS config, which is somewhat easy to do, it's, it's, it's a rather large set of options that, that all kind of combine in some ways. Um, if you go off that hacky path, we kind of bring you back. And, and so it's sort of a managed TypeScript experience, stuff like that. Um, the next is build command, uh, a bit simpler. It's just really there. Uh, you run once and what you get is a, a, a optimized bundle that's uh, output. And this is great for lean deployments. So uh, generally great anyway to, to get a leaner uh, bundle size for deploying anywhere, whether it's Roku or serverful things. It's just nice to, to get the size down. Um, Kubernetes deployment, whatever. But for serverless, this is, this is obviously like actually quite, quite important. So uh, Nexus build sort of handles this uh, for you. So between these two commands, there's a few others, but these two commands are really gonna be uh, what you spend most of your time with on the Nexus CLI. All right, a little lag there. Okay. And uh, all API features. So they include a focus on type safety, auto completion, and JS doc. Uh, still work in progress. Um, but these, these are the sort of, there's, and there's always more, but these are three really core parts that we're really um, paying a special attention to as we develop the API. Um, all these three parts should be really harmonious and always feel great. Uh, as well, the API and CLI, uh, and so, and the CLI, uh, all these features include sort of a focus on the extensibility. So you get these sort of, the potential for these rich end-to-end -end plugins that they're not only going to extend the runtime, uh, but you're going to get really tight integration into your developer experience at dev time. Um, so things in maybe uh, generating additional files or reacting to new file types on change um, and, and a lot more. So what are the goals of Nexus? Um, seven for now. Uh, one, scale gracefully from, a simple, uh, from simple to complex, prototype to production. Uh, two, be type safe without excessive generics or incomprehensible type errors. Three, have an API that is declarative. Four, be largely learnable by just using it. Five, be deeply extensible. Six, be zero config. And seven, approach zero boilerplate. Okay, so hopefully uh, that gives you a very high level sense roughly on sort of what Nexus is, 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 yeah, is about and, and, and uh, the scope of it. Um, but now we're gonna dive in deep. So Flavio, um, is going to take us here on an amazing journey, super fun, and uh, go for it. Awesome, thanks. <clears throat> I'm going to take the screen sharing. Uh, one quick note, uh, we have a small issue, I believe, with the Q&A, uh, because we haven't enabled uh, questions to be public and uh, for people to be able to upvote them. All right, taking a look at that now. Cool, awesome. So um, let's start with um, how the workshop is gonna, um, is gonna proceed. Um, we have around six chapters to follow. Um, the way it's gonna work is that I'm, going, I'm gonna go through each chapters one by one. Um, I'll do it myself first. I'll try to explain to you um, details of the tutorial and, and why things are the way they are. After I'm done, uh, we will give you every time 
up to 20 minutes for each uh, chapter. Um, and if you are done before these 20 minutes, we ask you to just use the raise hand feature of Zoom to tell us that you're done. And once we see that there's a vast majority of people uh, that are done, um, and if that's the case before the 20 minute, then we'll just uh, move on. One thing that we would like to ask you, um, we assume that there are some people which want uh, code um, and, and want try to build a framework, uh, sorry, the, the tutorial. If that's the case, please just raise your hand all the time so that we know uh, like that we don't wait for you every time and, and that we can have a better heuristic for who's, who's ready and, and who's not. Awesome. So um, that's how the tutorial and the workshop is gonna go. Um, did I forget anything? I don't think so. In the, you must have received the mail, I believe, uh, about the workshop that linked you uh, to this repo here. This repo is a starter kit, basically, for the workshop. If you haven't git loaned and, and installed it, there is a few steps here that you need to do. I am going to uh, link you to that send that link, sorry, to the chat right now so that you can um, do it now. Uh, where is my Zoom window? I do not find it anymore. That's great. More chat, there we go, awesome. So open list and attendees, there is the repo. Um, I will ask you also before we start uh, the workshop to raise your hand uh, if you have already set up everything so that we can start uh, once everything has done it. Uh, if you haven't, then please take your time, just loan. And meanwhile, what I'll do is quickly present um, what we'll build in the end. So, as Jason mentioned, we are going to build a blog application, uh, a simple one. Um, which uh, I am going to present to you now. So give me a few seconds. I will present the blog application only from the consumer perspective. So we'll only have a look at the playground where we'll send a couple of queries and look at the schema. Okay, let me zoom a bit here. So um, it's, it's a pretty simple GraphQL schema. We have a couple of mutations here. Uh, we have two to handle authentication, one to sign up, one to log in. Um, and uh, we have one to create a draft. So a draft is basically a post that hasn't been published yet. So the workflow is the following. Typically, you would create a post that you would uh, create as a draft so that you can share it, edit it before you publish it. Once you're done, then you publish that draft and it becomes um, well, public to everyone. That's, that's the workflow that we are going to build. We won't be, so we will be covering authentication during the workshop, uh, but we're not sure that we'll have enough time. So what we'll probably end up doing is I'll just live code the, the authentication, which will be the last part of the workshop, uh, but you won't get to implement it yourself. The code is available anyway online, so that, that shouldn't be a big deal. Um, last details, so we have a post um, and the post has like a title, a body, and it's published. That's more or less um, the schema that we're going to build. So let's, let's try around uh, some of the mutations to see how it, how it works. So we'll first log in. Well, we could sign up first. I think I'm already signed up. So I'll first log in here. Um, once I log in, I receive a token, which I'll use to authenticate to perform some of the mutations. I'll put that JSON web token into the headers here. And then I will start by creating a draft. <clears throat> so Nexus Workshop Body 2020. Uh, whoops, I just need to restart something. There we go. Let's create our draft. Once this draft is created, we can make sure that um, we have that draft in our list. There we go. 
ID2, this is exactly the drop that we've published. We can try, by the way, to remove the headers to make sure that we can not access the data without being authenticated. If I run the query now, it tells us not authorized. So let's bring it back. Once we have the draft, we can now publish it. So I'll make sure to put the JSON web token again. Uh, we run the publish mutation on the draft that has an ID2. There we go. We've just published the draft and now we should be able without being authenticated because now the draft is public to see the post um, that we've just published. That's more or less what we've, we're going to build. I hope I did not already lose you. Uh, it should be fairly, a fairly simple GraphQL API, uh, but still should allow us to go through uh, a lot of interesting details of Nexus. Awesome. So um, before we get going, I'm going to check, maybe you can tell me, Jason, um, how many people have git clone the repo. So we have 40 now, and it's going up again. All right, so I suggest yeah, we wait 50, five, 50 five, five, five to 10 more minutes, <clears throat> and then we'll start uh, the workshop. I haven't mentioned something, sorry though. Um, the workshop that we are going to do is based on the tutorial that we've written a couple of months, well, a month ago now. Um, so, like I said, I will go through every chapter myself and then uh, you will have the tutorial as uh, a document to repeat everything I've done just before. Um, the tutorial should be linked into the workshop, you can find it here. Beware though that what you basically clone here um, is the same content as the part zero and one, um, which is all about installing Nexus and getting up, uh, up and ready. Um, so we will start at the second chapter. Um, last detail, if you don't have enough time at the end of a chapter, uh, among the 20 minutes that we give you. If you don't have enough time to do it, uh, don't stress out. What we've done is that we've created branches for every chapter. Um, so if you don't have enough time and we just move on to the next chapter and I'll show you how to do it, but just check out <clears throat> the chapter that we've just done and you'll be up and ready uh, to follow uh, the next one with me. Cool, so we have 57 people claiming to be ready. Maybe there are already some questions in the chat. Nope. We've got a couple of questions in Q&A that I'm typing yep. answers to. Um, but I don't know if you want to take any uh, vocally. Um, so one, one I'll take right now actually, ETA for being production ready. We get this one uh, yep. you know, somewhat often. Um, what I could say there is there's no concrete plans uh, or roadmap to 1.0 right now. Um, Nexus schema, which the Nexus framework builds on top of, is used in production, um, including at Cypress, uh, where Tim Greaser works uh, for, for quite a while. Um, I think it's presumably like conceivable, right, that we would hit 1.0 next year. Um, I, I don't see why not. But it's all speculation, right? So there's no guarantees here. Um, and I think what, what production ready means for various people differs. So some features uh, will be very robust, others will be newer. Um, and so like a general 1.0 um, would be awesome to hit it this year. Again, there's no concrete plans for that. So next year probably makes a lot of sense. Um, but again, no guarantees either. I, I don't see why not though. I don't see why it wouldn't be next year. Um, but again, I wanna emphasize that uh, I think not all features will be sort of equally mature. And for users whose use cases fall under the more mature features, then I think production ready doesn't necessarily mean it has to be 1.0. Um, we can actually look at like Prisma as an example that just went GA recently and it's awesome. Um, but in the 2.1 release, they've added, for example, JSON filtering, right? So if JSON filtering was for some reason, the thing you absolutely needed for going production, well, you'd have to wait for that. So I think it's hard to answer, but, but general, you know, generally the 1.0 question, um, we will, yeah, I think see that uh, for sure sometime next year, but uh, for sure, like, uh, but again, no guarantees. Yeah. 
Cool. Thanks. Um, oh, yeah. There is something we haven't mentioned. I see there is a question here, which is, and I'm going to type it, answer live. What's the path for Nexus on Windows? Uh, I assume by path, you mean path forward? Like, what's, what's our plan um, for Windows? Uh, this is actually something we are going to tackle uh, during our next print. Um, so very soon, I cannot give a day per se exactly when this is going to be done, but this is definitely on our short term roadmap and we plan on um, yeah, making, making Nexus compatible with Windows very soon. Uh, for any people, if anyone here is using Windows, uh, yeah, sorry about that. Uh, I think we forgot to mention it. We, we said it in the original email, uh, yeah. but Nexus does not work with Windows yet. All right. Um, shall we shall we move on? I see there's 50, yeah. 60 people who raised their we're, hand. Uh, it seems like just it's... Just over. Um, 61. Looks like, looks like we're, we're, we're over the pass-fail spectrum here, so we can maybe... We can run with a pass here, um, over 50%. Um, and yep. again, um, if, if, uh, if you are just watching along, uh, just keep your hand raised at all times and, and that, will, that will help us along too. Cool, so let's get going. Um, so chapter two, writing your first schema. Um, so we'll jump straight into the code here and, and start building the GraphQL API. A uh, quick tour of, of what you've just cloned. Um, it's, it's very empty uh, for now. Um, we can start by running um, the dev command. Uh, so here's the dev script, which runs Nexus dev. Whoops, so we have the other GraphQL API running. There you go. Um, and you should normally have this message uh, that tells you that the GraphQL schema is empty, which, which is expected, right, as we uh, the project is empty. Um, however, you can still see that the server is running already, um, which, which might be a bit confusing. Um, so one thing that you need to know about Nexus, the framework, is that we bundle a, a GraphQL, well, an HTTP server under the hood. Um, for now, that server is Express. And when your schema is empty, uh, we just create uh, some kind of um, placeholder schema so that um, the application can start running. So here we, here we have just a simple uh, OK field that you can use to query. There you go, it works, and, and that's it. Um, we also have another file uh, that will explain um, what it is later. Um, this file is basically the, re the representation of your GraphQL API um, in the SDL format, which is some kind of serialized version of your GraphQL schema. Before we start uh, building the GraphQL API, I, I just want to talk about um, some, some unconventional way um, uh, that Nexus uh, has to work. Um, and um, this mechanism, we call it reflection. And what it is, is that in order for Nexus to work properly, we need to run your app and derive from your GraphQL schema some artifacts. Some of them are well, exactly what I just showed you, the SDL uh, type, uh, file here. But we also derive from that some typings, um, some TypeScript types. And um, it is absolutely necessary that you run the dev command while you work on Nexus every day during the, during the tutorial, during the workshop, so that you get proper feedback about around auto-completion and type errors as you, as you make changes to your schema. Um, we plan to lift that limitation later by um, creating a VS Code extension that will just do that without you having to run a command, but for now that's a limitation. So please, 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 if you see that you have type errors, unexpected type errors, um, make sure that you run the dev command. All right, end of talking, let's start building the GraphQL API. So uh, we saw earlier that like we said, we're going to build a blog application. So the first thing to do is to create some um, types that, we, that will represent um, our posts for our blog. And to do that, um, we will um, import um, the schema component, that's how we call it from Nexus. 
And the schema component essentially is uh, where you will have all the tools to build your GraphQL schema. I want to reiterate one, one, one time to make sure that you, you got that properly. Um, do not like try to follow right now. Well, you can if you want, but you don't have to. We will give you at, at the end of, of at the chapter uh, around 20 minutes to redo everything I'm doing. So no need to rush right now and try to follow what I'm doing. So um, in the schema component, you have basically all the tools that you need to build your GraphQL API. Uh, your GraphQL schema. Um, here, we want to create an object type um, that is named post, and we will um, give it some fields. So like we said earlier, the post um, type has a couple of fields. The first one is its ID. Um, it has a title, it has a body, and it has a Boolean, uh, sorry, not a Boolean, but a published field of type Boolean. So if you're completely new to Netsys, um, just trying to explain very quickly um, what happens here. Um, so you get a function and you're passed some parameter that we conventionally call T. Um, and in this object, uh, you get basically functions uh, that will help you properly type every field of your GraphQL schema. Um, so here we've just said that the post has a field ID of type int, um, a field title of type string, a field body of type string, and a field published of type boolean. We can actually already use um, the generated SDL file here to see uh, what we've just created. And you can, we can see here that we now have the post type. So let me now maybe use that to, that opportunity to explain to you um, why this file is here and why we think it's, it's pretty important. So there's two reasons. The first one is um, we know that the code first um, paradigm somehow is, is not yet super familiar in the JavaScript ecosystem. And so if you're not familiar with it, uh, having a way to visualize um, what you do in code and, and what it transforms to is, is pretty useful. Uh, you, you, it really helps you uh, have a feeling of, of everything you do in code and, and how that translates to the format that you were used to before. Um, and the second reason, which we think is, is a lot more important, as your API is gonna grow and maybe you're gonna make changes and maybe you work in a team um, with a lot of, not a lot of people, but some people um, this file is super useful um, to version control and to push as part of your PRs. And the reason is it's really a format that is human friendly and super easy to read. Um, and so it really gives a super nice overview without even going into the code. Uh, it really gives a nice overview of the changes that were applied to the schema. So you can, at a glance, see whether there was a breaking change, what, uh, what fields uh, were added. And it's maybe even like a better place to put comments about the different changes that you've made to your schema. So that's why we generate it by default. You can disable it if you don't like it, um, if it's unnecessary to you. Um, but yeah, we'll, we'll use it pretty much uh, a lot during, during the tutorial to always refer to um, um, to see the changes that we've applied in code. All right, so um, we've created our post type. Now it's time to create our first query to be able to read our post. And there are two ways we could do that, right? Um, the intuitive way, I guess, would be to create now a query.ts file um, and repeat somehow what we've done before. So we import schema from Nexus and we create uh, a query type and we start uh, defining our fields. But that's not what we're going to do. Um, and the problem with that approach is that as your, AP, as your API is going to grow, you are going to end up um, potentially with um, a lot of fields in your query type, all gathered in one same file. And we think that doesn't scale well for big applications. So instead, what we are going to do is delete the file and we are going to collocate every queries and mutations alongside the type that it refers to. So to do that, we will use the extend type method. It's pretty easy to do. Uh, you tell which type you want to extend 
we can already he, here have a sense of um, the kind of autocompletion that you get with Nexus. Um, we already have the post type that we created above if we wanted to extend it. In that case, though, we want to extend the query type and we want to um, create a field to be able to create some posts. So the first field that we are going to create that I've just showed you before is the draft field. So let's go ahead and do that. Um, do that, we will use the t.field method. Um, the name of the field is going to be draft. Um, the output type of that field is gonna be a post. Uh, it's actually going to be a list of posts. And uh, we will say here that that list won't be nullable. Uh, and we will see um, in a second what this means. So this true. There we go. I think it's not yet. Let me restart. Okay, so we have uh, now our query type. We have a draft uh, field. There we go, it does update it. And that draft field uh, returns a non nullable list of posts. Now, what we need to do is implement the resolver uh, that will return some posts. As we do not have um, as we do not have any database yet, uh, for now, we will just um, implement it. Uh, we'll just hard code the value basically. So we return an array. And here again, uh, you can see how Nexus is fully type safe, right? The return type of my resolver gives me the fields that are um, needed for my post type to be able to resolve, right? So I need an ID, one, I need a title, Nexus, somebody. Oops. And because it's a draft, as we said, initially it's not published. So we will hard code it to false. Awesome. Um, now that we have that, we are ready to try our first query. So let's go back to our playground <clears throat> and try to query our first draft. So ID title, body, published. Cool. We now have our first draft and we've just successfully covered the first chapter. Which means uh, for those of you who want to do it, it's now time for you to um, go on that URL that I'm going to share right now if you don't have it yet. So chat, chat, this chapter, and we will wait um, around 15 to 20 minutes um, so that you can complete it yourself. There's all the steps and explanations about everything I've done. And in the meantime, I guess we will try to answer uh, the questions. Uh, okay. One thing though, participants, let me check something. Oh yeah, people have unraised their hand. So that's perfect. Yep. Once you're one done, please, that yeah, raise your hand and um, once there's enough people, we'll just move on. Hey Flaviano, one thing um, on the answer to Windows, uh, I think in the Q&A panel there, you can press done and that will kind of mark the completion of your, voc your, your vocalized answer. Oh, okay, cool. All right. And um, also a reminder, everyone is able to upvote uh, in the Q&A. So even if you don't have a question uh, yourself, you might be curious to what others are asking and maybe upvote something that, uh, that strikes you as interesting. Um, Flavio, maybe uh, while we're uh, in this uh, transition uh, phase here, it's a good time to uh, take off some of the top, top rated ones here vocally. Mm -hmm. yeah. whatever, whatever you uh, want to take on here. I'll, I'll, I'll answer others uh, as you continue into chapter two, but. Uh. So there, there aren't a lot of easy questions here. <laughs> I took those already, so left you the hard ones. <clears throat> I'll take an easy one. Can I use, oh, that's been answered already, right? 
can I use a globally installed Nexus CLI or do I need to use the local one for every project? Um, you can use the, you can use the globally installed one. If you have it installed locally and you run it globally, um, the global one will hand off execution to the local one. Yeah, that can be kind of convenient um, if you, uh, yeah, whereas if you're using Yarn or NPM, you, you have to kind of remember how to call into your local bin. Uh, having the global Nexus kind of reduces the friction there. And you can do things like uh, on my machine, I have Nexus alias to just N. So I can just use N anywhere in my machine and I'm working with the local, it's a globally installed CLI, but I'm working with the uh, locally installed Nexus. And uh, there's some checks and balances there to make sure that, for example, if it's a Nexus project defined as you have Nexus installed in a local package JSON, but it's unable to hand off to the local CLI because maybe you forgot to do an install of your packages. Um, the global CLI will not just start running the global package of Nexus, will actually tell you, please install your local Nexus. So it's sort of a safe, safe handoff that, that is strict to make sure you're not uh, surprised by the results. Um, therefore, the point is you can kind of not worry about what the global version of Nexus is because, because you're going to be running the local version of Nexus. So just a little thin proxy. Uh, that, that kind of makes things convenient sometimes. Oh, that's it. All right, I'll take next the most voted one right now. I'll read it out loud. So been following Prisma slash Nexus for a while. One of the things I've struggled with understanding what is the best way to get started as things have changed over time. For instance, there's a lot of documentation out there related to Prisma, GraphQL Yoga, Nexus, GraphQL Cogen, Prisma 2, etc but I've always not been sure what I'm, okay, what, what I've always not been sure is what I'm looking at the current best practice for getting started, or maybe I'm going down a path of using all their tool sets. I wanted to see what thoughts others may have around this. So um, I think there are two entry points uh, that you have today. Um, the easiest one I would say right now is to use um, the Nexus framework. Um, during the workshop, we made you install everything manually or, no, put differently, we made you clone a repo, uh, but you can actually very easily start uh, with Nexus from scratch using the, and uh, I have my screen shared here, you can use the NPX Nexus <coughs> command line. Oh wait, but I need to be on a, in an empty folder. So, test test and get Nexus, um, and that will run you through some kind of wizard to um, install Nexus, additionally uh, set up Prisma as well, if you wish, and, and you'll end up with a GraphQL API that is ready to run. So here you choose your package manager, whether or not you want to use Prisma, uh, which database you want to use, after you press um, enter, you'll get a fully running GraphQL API. That's the easiest way of getting up to speed today with the framework. Um, the other way is by going through the examples, I would say, uh, that are available either on um, uh, the examples repo on the GraphQL Nexus. Um, I just sent that into chat for everyone. No, cool. the, the repo link. So that repo, um, if you don't want to use a framework and you prefer using Nexus schema, then you should have an example repo, uh, sorry, a folder in, in the schema repo itself. Um, and if your entry point is more Prisma, um, then there's also a Prisma examples uh, repo, which gives you a couple of examples using GraphQL. So I'm not sure I'm really answering your question because I feel like this shows you that there's too much entry point maybe. Uh, the point is, I think all of these should, if there are not, then it's a mistake, but all of these should always be up to date. Um, they essentially show the same thing in the end, but just from different entry points. Uh, so regardless of from where you come from, uh, you, sh you should end up with the same result. Yeah. One, um, one yep, go ahead. I was just gonna say, um. And there is some complexity that will be like, yeah, be, be removed from the picture uh, in the near future. So we're currently going through a process of unifying the uh, Prisma plugins for Nexus. So that will look a bit simpler soon. 
And right now there's two because there's a two tier architecture of uh, plugins. Um, and actually Flavio, maybe you wanna bring up the uh, uh, schematic here uh, in the Nexus website in the architecture uh, page, um, just so that people can kind of see the package relationships um, while I talk about that. Let's, let's kind of kind of paint, like give a visual image here. So that's uh, in the meta section under architecture. Um, and then I think it should be one of the first things. So it's, uh, it's gonna take a second to load there, but uh, it's at the very top. There you go. So, um, so some ways that things are gonna simplify soon are that the Nexus plugin, uh, sorry, the Prisma plugin for Nexus is currently two packages because there is a library level and a framework level. So this is gonna unify into a single package soon. So that will help a little bit. Uh, another thing that the user asked about or mentioned in this question was yoga. So yoga is going to uh, close down soon. It's not really maintained. I think the most kind of activity there has been at least a year old. So um, this will kind of simplify the ecosystem a little bit. Now, when you look at something like uh, GraphQL code gen, uh, that's just simply a sort of a separate, ca like categorically is a separate kind of tool. Um, and so, so it doesn't really fit in. It's not, uh, not really comparable, but uh, yeah. So I, I think it is still, GraphQL has always been a rich ecosystem, which does mean it's also somewhat complex to navigate. Um, but I do want to point out that uh, the ways that we can, it will be simplified in the near future as well. Okay, <clears throat> thanks. Uh, we have 37 hands raised. Uh, it's already uh, five or seven for me, depending on the time zone. I didn't check at one time I stopped. Oh, just jumping up a lot. I think you got you got people, uh, you woke up some people there. So yeah, oh. I think we can move forward. Um, all right, so if you haven't been able to um, do what I've done here, uh, let me show you how to get up and running again. So let's just go back to folder. What you do is basically you erase everything you've done and you check out, um, so git checkout chapter and two. And there we go. We have pretty much everything we've done. From here, we can run the dev server again and we can move on. Oops, looks like there's a small mistake. Um, so if you do check out the branch, uh, it, it says it looks like you chained dot list and set list for draft. What this refers to is you can define a field uh, output type to be a list either by seeing list true or by using a shortcut, uh, doing t dot list dot something, but you can't do both. So uh, remove one or the other. That's a small mistake on our side. Cool. So let's go uh, and do chapter three. Tutorial, adding mutations to our API. So in this chapter, we will um, write mutations. Uh, we will add a, an in-memory database for now before we add Prisma. Um, and we will show how to work with the GraphQL context and with GraphQL arguments. So the first step that we'll do is creating our in-memory database. So let's go ahead and create a db.ts file. Again, you will have time at the end to do all of that. Um, let's um, create a DB object, which will represent our memory database. Um, and in our database, we have a list of posts, well, an array of posts, and we'll pretty much just port the data that we initially returned in our resolver um, to that DB. So I'll just copy past it here. Okay, so now that we have our DB object, um, what we wanna do is pass that DB object into our GraphQL context so that we can use it from within our resolver. So here, uh, we haven't used the arguments from the resolver. If you're familiar with GraphQL, you should be familiar with that as well. Um, the second parameter here is the context and we, we wanna get the context here. So the way we do that, uh, you can do it from pretty much everywhere, but we will use this app.ts file, which is essentially the entry point of your 
app. If it's empty, it's fine. Um, it, it, it still works. Um, but now we have more stuff to add to. Um, so to add stuff to your context, um, you need to import schema, the schema component. <clears throat> And you need to add the add contest method as the name suggests. Um, so we get the incoming request here. And what we want to do is pass the DB. So I'll import the DB and I'll return the DB into that function. Now, this is pretty unconventional. Um, and we'll get in a second why it's unconventional. But normally, if everything's working properly, I should already be able to access now my DB inside my context. And it's typed. That's what's unconventional. We haven't used any kind of type annotation. We haven't said, like, we, we haven't defined any TypeScript type to, to define our context type. Just by returning that object here, we have automatically typed our context. So that's part of. Um, one of the goals that we've been mentioning before of Nepsis, which is to reduce as much as possible um, the amount of type uh, annotation that you need to do so that the, um, um, the entry to Nepsis stays relatively simple, even if you're not uh, familiar with TypeScript. So now we have our database that is given to us in the context, which means we can access it, which means we can return the post, suppose. Um, and uh, we want to return the post, but we want to return only the posts that were not published, right? So we will filter them by saying published equal post. Here we go. Uh, these are unused, so we'll just put some underscore before, and we should basically get the very same result now. Um, we won't try it yet. Instead, we will start to create our first mutation now. So same story as for the query. Um, <clears throat> we could have created a mutation that says file, but we won't do that. Instead, we will collocate um, the mutations that are related to the post type in the post.js file. So instead of extending the query type, we will extend the mutation type. And the mutation that we will create now is um, the create draft mutation so that we can actually, um, well, create some draft. So just like for um, the draft query here, uh, we'll use t.field and we'll name our mutation create draft. And same story, uh, it's of type post. Again, you can see um, every type that we can refer to here. So type post. Um, nullable false, and we have a resolver. Now, to be able to create a draft, um, we need to be a to allow users, consumer of the API, to pass some arguments to that field. Um, and the way you do that with Nexus is by using the art option here. So it's pretty simple to use. Um, as a key, you define the name of the art. So here, title. And the type of that argument will be um, defined using this star art method. So id art, int art, float art, string art, boolean art. If you need to reference not a scalar, which is not an id, yeah, not a scalar, but an object, an input object type, then you can use the arg method. Um, and there you will basically uh, give the type. Um, here, the title is gonna be of type string. So all we need is to use the string arg utility and we'll say that it's required. Now we are going to duplicate that and we'll also have an argument for um, the body. So now if we look at our SDL, um, and this takes a bit of time to refresh. Come on. Come 
come on. There we go. Um, we now have a create draft mutation, which takes two argument, body and title, and it returns us a post. So now all we need to do is to implement the resolver. And you can see here again that we have a type error. Um, one that is a bit hard to understand, but that basically tells us that we need to um, return some value here, um, some value that is a post. Um, so let's go ahead and create our draft. Again, this is all in memory for now. So uh, a draft has an ID. Uh, for now, we will simulate um, the ID of the post by, well, the length of the array. And the title will be, notice here also how suddenly the args of my field are typed as well, based on what I've done here, based on the args that I've defined. If I put body, well, I will see that later. So args title, body, args body, and Again, published needs to be false by default because it's just a draft. Once we've done that, then all we need to do is to push that draft to our database, push and return the draft. All good. Um, and I guess we'll move faster now a bit, and we'll create the publish mutation. So same story, it's a bit repetitive now. Um, so to recap, the publish mutation is um, the one that converts a draft to uh, a, a published post. So what it's gonna return is a post. Um, it takes some arguments. The argument that it takes is a draft ID. Um, so the draft that we've just created before. Um, this is going to be an int. It's going to be required. And then we can do the resolver. Um, so root art context. Same story here. The art contextually are typed based on the art that we've defined here. So we have access to our draft ID. So first thing we're going to do is to, well, identify the draft to be published. So draft to publish equal db.post.find. And the ID of the post needs to be equal the draft ID that was passed. If there is no such draft ID, then we'll just throw a new error saying could not find draft with ID um, args of draft ID. If we um, Yep, sorry. If we do have uh, the draft ID, however, then we can just mutate. Uh, this is not great, but again, this is just for example, for um, showcase purpose. So uh, it's fine here. We mutate the draft, which is essentially uh, an update for a, an update that you would do on a proper database. Um, and we return that draft. Awesome. So um, what do we have left? Um, yep, finally, what we can also do is adding um, our query to query the post. So now we are able to create the draft. We are able to query the draft. Then we can publish our draft. Now we just need a query to be able to read the published draft, which are the posts. So same as above. Uh, the post, which will return post. And whoops, arts context. And so the post will essentially be taken from our in memory database again but we will only return the posts that were published, as we said many times now. Cool, so we're done. Uh, we can always now have a look at our GraphQL schema. It's always cool to uh, have such a nice view of what we've built. 
Um, to recap, we have two mutations, one to create a draft, another one to publish the draft, and we have two query as one to read the draft and one to read the published post. Um, we can now go ahead and try it out uh, on the playground. So let's go. Um, let's first create a draft. Again, same as before, we create it. There we go, we have our second draft. So the reason it's the second one is because we still have some data already uh, in our database, right? So the second one we create is ID2. Once we have that ID, first we can see whether we do have drafts. We can see that we have two. <coughs> Sorry. Then we can publish draft number two. Once that's done, it should no longer be in the draft, but it should now be in the list of posts. ID title. There we go. ID title body published, and we have now uh, our post. Um, that's it for chapter two. I hope that wasn't too fast or too repetitive. Um, I will now send again, in case you don't have it, the link in the chat to chapter three. There we go. We will give you roughly 15 minutes to 20 minutes to do it. Uh, once you're done, please raise your hand. If you have any feedback already that you want to share in the chat um, as regarding, I don't know, um, the speed at which we're going um, and whether it's even interesting, please uh, feel free to share so that we can uh, already enhance ourselves for the rest of the workshop. Um, Jason, are you deep down into Q and A? Yeah, it's uh, it's it's like co-pilot stuff. So there was one at the top uh, that I was uh, leaving for vocal response here, um, and it's from Luke Hamilton, who's asking um, about polymorphic relations. And so I don't appear to be able to comment on these uh, questions like users can. Maybe it's because I'm a host or something. Um, I'm only able to answer. But I didn't want to answer yet because I wanted to get your uh, input here. So I believe this question, uh, first of all, like polymorphic relations on a GraphQL API or GraphQL schema level that's already possible with union types. But I think his question is about the Prisma level. Um, and he was asking this, I think, as you were setting up your, uh, or maybe not. But, but anyway, so I think this is at the, the, the DB schema level that Luke is asking uh, so with the Prisma schema. But is it though? So will there be support for polymorphic relations? For example, suppose I have a post and a comment and I want to be able to comment on both a post and a comment. So the comment model would have a field corresponding to what was commented on. Okay. And then he says, currently I need to have three models, post, comment, and post comment. Okay, you're right that he refers to models. Um, Do we support polymorphic relations on Prisma? That's a great question, which I don't have the answer to. Yeah. Uh, my, my hunch is we, I know it's a long, it's actually something when I was first discovering Prisma myself a couple of years ago it was uh, a feature I was uh, asking for, but I didn't really have to make a new issue for it because other people were asking for it. Uh, it's been this, this longstanding thing. Um, to my knowledge, I'm not aware of it being supported yet, but I, I yep. also don't have a, I don't have like a definite answer about that. Um, I just checked in the docs that there is no mention at all of polymorphic. Yeah. Maybe it's named differently, but I don't think uh, so. So um, to answer your question, no. Well, the question is, will there be? Um, I guess we could do the search to find an issue about it. Um, I don't know if there is one. Uh, so uh, yeah. Point is, I cannot answer whether or not right now uh, there will be uh, support for polymorphic yeah. relations. You might, yeah. you, you, you'd better create an issue on the Prisma repo and, and ask the question or in this yeah. slide. And Harshit just confirmed on chat that, that no Prisma does not have polymorphic relations support right now. Thanks Harshit. So uh, I see a couple of errors in the chat. Um, <clears throat> a question from Let's Lenzo in the chat. In the mutations, 
is that where you would put in business logic, like making sure user has access to add, edit, delete. Yes and no. So um, right now, the way we're designing our GraphQL API is that we are putting the logic um, inside the resolver. So you're free to do so. Um, and yes, you could indeed um, put uh, the business logic in there, such as making sure, for instance, that you cannot publish a draft that is not yours. So, so right now we do not have yet the concept of a user. So that's why we don't have that implemented yet. Um, in the chapters coming, we will implement uh, the business logic inside the resolver. We will also show um, how this is fine at the beginning, as, even with testing. However, as your API grows, um, you might be better extracting that logic off of your resolvers. Um, and the reason is you might want to reuse some uh, bits of business logic um, across several resolvers. And so extracting that, extracting that elsewhere so that you can easily reuse, reuse it and maybe also unit test it uh, is um, yeah, encouraged. I would say so. Then we have a question. <clears throat> so property, it's another question, but an error. Property then is missing in type. So that looks like an error related to promises. Is there, um as, as one solution, uh, sort of cheating, but is there, do we have a checkout, a branch checkout? Yep, um, sure. That we could also share with them? Um, yep, um, I'll do it live, but um, just like for the previous chapter, I will actually already um, ch check it out. So discard all four files, git checkout chapter three. And there you should have the very same uh, content that just came before. Um, to answer your question though, uh, I'm sorry if I did not pronounce your name well. Um, Huang, I guess. Um, please make sure that you do have the dev command running. Maybe that's, that's uh, a lead. If that still doesn't work, uh, yeah, please try to check out chapter three and see what, what you've been doing wrong. All right. Um, let's see in the list of participants if we have people start to raise their hands. 38, 39, 40. So maybe we can do one more Q&A before we move on, one or two. All right, so I'll answer the first question that I see here <clears throat> from Raselio. Good morning. I've been playing with Nexus the last weekend and found it super cool. I found I was considering it for an app I'm developing since I saw it's kind of production ready. However, subscription being really critical, I had to revert to Nexus Prisma. I think you meant Nexus Schema instead. So what's the main objective of this workshop? Prepare for release next year or for some non advanced case, it's, it's possible to use it as a server. Um, so I guess the main question here is around, there are two questions. First is, will we support subscription? That's what I kind of understand. And the second would be, uh, what is the, the objective of this workshop? Um, regarding the objective of the workshop, I guess that's really just to uh, introduce a Nexus framework uh, to people. We won't go through um, complex advanced use cases uh, right now. It's especially hard as a workshop um, to do so and to introduce um, new, new concepts 
Um, then for you, the second question, uh, we actually sent a poll recently on Twitter that asked people what they would like to see next on Nexus. Subscription has been uh, something very, uh, one of the top results, basically. We do not yet know when we will uh, tackle subscription. Um, one thing though, <clears throat> there is already, so uh, when, how can I find that? Nexus plugin subscription. So this is something unofficial. I don't know how stable that is, uh, but someone has started working on it. I think he's actually part of uh, the workshop. I think I saw his name. Um, <clears throat> we've tried to unblock one of his use cases, so we are uh, really happy to try to unblock people so that they can use subscriptions. It's unfortunately, I would say right now, not on the short-term roadmap, although we still haven't planned uh, next quarter, so it might very well uh, become one of our priority. We do have, though, other um, equally important um, features that we would like to add. Um, so. Another right answer, maybe uh, we will have it short term. What's sure that on the long term we want to support subscription. Um, do you have anything else to add on, on top of that, Jason? Um, there was a question about subscriptions came up uh, a little while ago. And I did mention that there's a good chance we'll be working on this in Q3 yep. this year. So uh, stay tuned. Um, there's a lot of great libraries and support for this already in the, in the GraphQL ecosystem. So with Nexus, we're not going to have to, I think, engineer too much. It's really going to be about um, making sure the experience works really well and that the libraries are well integrated. So uh, we're pretty optimistic that this isn't like, we're not talking sort of from scratch six months of work. Uh, I'm pretty confident that, that Q3 this year is realistic. Um, so, yeah, stay tuned. Hey, um, another one. So, can I use Wibbly instead of Wibbly? So, that one was already uh, answered. Good. How do you extend or modify the Nexus config to, for example, compile the GraphQL schema type in other paths? I'm not sure exactly what you mean, Enrique. Yeah, uh, I do not understand the question. Sorry. Do you maybe, Jason? How do you explain? So th there may be a question here about like multiple um, schemas here because I see the compile the GraphQL schema types in other path. Um, so if, if the question's around multiple GraphQL schemas, um, this is something that is not possible today. So it's sort of like a uh, requirement that you've got one schema mapped to one Nexus app. Um, you could do a mono repo and have a couple going, but there's not this way of maybe, yeah, managing multiple schemas in a single Nexus project today. It's come up a couple times, so we may explore that in the future. Um, we're at we're over half now with people ready to move okay. on. So, um, yeah, yeah, let's uh, let's maybe keep keep it rolling and. Uh, awesome. Yep. Definitely. So, let's go back to tutorial, part four, testing the API. <clears throat> So we've now added uh, quite a lot of um, patients and queries, and we'll um, have first um, opportunity to see how we think of testing with Nexus. Um, there is a couple of dependencies that you will have to install uh, in this um, uh, chapter. And um, yeah, I suggest we, we start. Um, Going. So we will use Jest for this chapter. Um, Nexus is not tied yet, at least uh, to Jest. Um, we uh, 
however we recommend you to use just as we we have only tested it with just uh, but you should be able to use other um, testing libraries so the way we think of testing with nexus at least um, in ways that we can help you is at the level of what we call system tests so um, system tests are very high level tests that only test your GraphQL API from the point of view of the user. So instead of testing, unit testing some business logic, what we'll do is really just send queries to our API and um, ensure that the result is one that we extend. So let's go ahead and see how that works and, and how that helps us um, actually testing our API. So as I said, first thing I, we need to do is um, install Jest and uh, the types of Jest and TS Jest. There we go. Meanwhile, uh, we will create a test folder and create a post.test.csi. Cool. Uh, we need to do a couple of things in our package.json to configure Jest. Um, so Jest, <coughs> um, the preset, so that's in order for Jest to work properly with TypeScript. So it'll be TS Jest and the test environments will be node. Uh, there we go. And finally, uh, for convenience, we'll add a uh, test script, which will just run Jest. Awesome. Um, then what we need to do as a last step is create a helper file, um, which we will use to create um, a super handy helper uh, that we'll use in, in our test. And, and to do that, we will import some stuff from Nexus slash testing. So slash testing is where you will find all the tools that we provide you for testing. For now, it's super simple. We might have more in the future, um, but yeah. I am going to copy past that helper. Um, it's really just boilerplate. The reason we do not um, bundle that helper yet, um, I, I'm not even sure we can, but the reason we don't do that yet is because uh, we want to wait a bit to uh, have a bit more feedback on the API so that uh, we can improve it better. So let's remove these comments and I'll just explain to you what this is going doing. So we have a function here, create test context. We will use that function in our test. And what it gives you is a couple of tools um, for us to query well, start our server, our GraphQL server, and uh, send queries against our GraphQL API. Um, so what this does here is um, put whatever data uh, is given from Nexus into um, our context, and that's done before all tests. And then we start the server, and once we are done with all of our tests, we stop it. Now, the way we use that thing is super simple. create test context, you just um, assign a variable to that helper that we've just created. Beware that this helper here will only work in uh, just context. Um, I think I haven't really explained it, but these functions here before all and after all, if you're not uh, familiar with Jest, um, these are life cycles that are provided by Jest. Um, and so Jest as a testing framework will call these um, life cycles um, whenever you run your test. So you have before all and you have also stuff like before each, et cetera, et cetera. All right, so <clears throat> um, what we want to do here, what do we want to test? Um, we want, for instance, to ensure that uh, a draft can be created uh, and published. So let's go ahead and test that. Uh, there we go. So in our test, thanks to our test context here, 
our API is already started. We don't have to do anything for that. The only thing we, we, we have to worry about here is sending queries to our API and ensuring that the result is the one we expect. So let's go ahead um, and uh, write our test or send our first query. Uh, first thing we want to do is create a draft. So we'll use the context method for that. And we see here that we have a client and that client is really just a GraphQL client that um, is fairly handy um, to send GraphQL query. It is already configured to uh, point to your local GraphQL API. So you can use send and I'll just copy pass from the tutorial. Uh, it's just gonna be easier here, um, the query. I'll remove that. So we can see uh, this is the same query that we've been sending um, on, on the chapter before. <clears throat> we now send it as part of our test. And then what we'll do is expect our draft results to match inline snapshots. So now if you're not familiar with just snapshots, um, this is a super handy feature. What this is going to do is um, read whatever is stored in that object and um, I'll, I'll actually run the test because I think I'm gonna explain it pretty, pretty bad. Let's run it, hopefully it's gonna work. It's not, that's amazing. Maybe I think I know what's going on. Uh, <coughs> I have some type errors that prevents Chess from running and running on my dev server might solve our issues. There we go. Let's try again. Awesome, all right. So test passes for now, it's not super useful, but I just wanted to show you what, what snapshots are in case you're not familiar with them. Um, it, it really, creates some kind of serialized version of your object um, so that um, you can ensure on uh, a subsequent test that the draft result will still be the same. Um, so we'll have a small issue here though, which is that I have not um, emptied the database. So we have ID two and it shouldn't be. So um, ID one, we wanna start from a fresh database on, on our test. All right, so <clears throat> let's move on. We have now a first um, snapshot that tests and ensures and shows actually that we, we did create a draft. Um, now, um, what I'll do is um, test and ensure that you can publish and that you properly have a result. So publish result, same story, await client that send. And again, I'll send I'll copy past the query from tutorial. So we have a mutation published draft, uh, which takes uh, a variable, the draft ID, uh, which I can pass here. And this is basically gonna be draft result dot create draft dot ID. Now, again, expect publish results dot too much inline snapshot. And so what I will be <clears throat> interested in here with the snapshots is to ensure that after my draft is published that the field here that I've snapshot as being false will actually be true um, once I've run the query. All right, we can see now that um, we did set our published field to true and that's it. So really the interesting bits here are that system tests allow you to <clears throat> query your API from the perspective of the user. And so you don't have to deal with implementation details. It doesn't even care here what kind of database you're using. And we'll see later that we'll switch our memory database to Prisma and the test will just run uh, just as well. So it's not perfect for every use cases, uh, but it really allows here for super clean tests where all you have to do is send a query, snapshot the result, done. 
if you ever change the business logic and how these things are working, if you ever mess up at some point your publish um, mutation, then this will be caught here and uh, the snapshot won't match. Um, yeah, do you have maybe anything else to add on this chapter, Jason? Um, I would say that the um, emphasis on unit testing, or rather the lack of emphasis on unit testing from Nexus um, is a strategy today that we'll definitely learn about as the community mm -hmm. grows and, and where we where we go with that. Um, it's most likely though going to stay out of scope because at the unit test level, there's not, not much needed anyway. That's sort of what makes unit tests nice. Um, so the, the focus here about this sort of black box, you know, here's, a, here's an input and then that's the output is probably gonna be where we, uh, we, we, make, we keep our focus. Now, there are system tests today because there's no mocking, right? And as we go further, I think uh, we'll see a little bit more uh, of the system testing with the database, but um, we may explore mocking more in the future because of, for example, uh, ease of testing uh, feedback, right? So if you run, uh, you know, a battery of dozens or hundreds of tests uh, against a real database, um, you may you may be waiting a little bit for that to get get results. And some some mocking can potentially be really nice there for quicker feedback loops, but at the same time. Uh, compromising on what they give you a system test in the first place to kind of give you a confidence that for a, for a real user, this will really work, um, is is then kind of degraded with mocking. So there's some trade-offs there and balances to be found and things like that, that uh, will be interesting to see as we go forward. I think there's a lot of room to explore there. Um, maybe not, maybe we don't mock, for example, but we still provide support to see databases with data to make a uh, system test easier, for example. So um, yeah, it's going to be interesting to see where that evolves, and I think community feedback will be huge here. Um, on a more technical level, uh, we have two users, uh, and I think I saw you responding, actually. So um, I, yep. think, I think they might have some environment variables set in a way that that's causing issues, but I'm not 100% sure. I think um, the error that, um, again, Wong is, is uh, facing is the same that I just faced, which is that after installing Jest, the typings were gone. Um, and so I, I think that's what you're facing. What you probably need to do is run dev again to um, fix the type errors because a lot of the types are generated and, and they just get wiped off when, when, when you wiped out, sorry, when you um, install dependencies. So running Nexus dev again should regenerate these types and then you should be able to uh, run the test again. Maybe I'm wrong though. Okay, so probably Awesome. Cool. Great. Yeah, and, and there's a good moment to replug what Flavio mentioned earlier on in the workshop that uh, a tighter experience here with regard to um, the reflection running in the background, this thing that, that we uh, alluded to and, and why you need Nexus Dev to be running uh, very often in, in your workflows. Uh, we're looking forward to you know, a, a more tighter, for example, VS, VS Code integration with a plugin that just, just does the right thing. You don't even think about it. Uh, and so we'll see, we'll see like that might still be a little ways out, but uh, this kind of experience here where the tests sort of fail and it's not super clear why uh, it's very unintuitive. This part of next, this is a part of Nexus that obviously is in scope for us to improve in the future. Yep. All right, Q and A for a bit. Sure. Um, there was one. Sure. So there was a question uh, by Bartek down below about, and it's a bit, it was like a very simple kind of technical one, I think related to some, something you were doing. So uh, it's, can you type draft const in your resolver as a post? So when he says type, I think he means like, like type casting. Um, so can you type cast uh, the draft const in your resolver as a post type? And I'm not sure if that makes sense in the context of what you were doing, Fabio, but, uh, and it's just, see, so you just commented. I'm just 
I do not understand the question. Do you? So in the drafts, you have the type post and I mean to get the auto completion when creating this variable. So but there is no the, variable here. So I'm not sure exactly um, which, like this does not produce any value. Right? You cannot assign, if, if that, if, if what you mean is doing drafts like that, um, no, you, you should not do that. Um, field is a void and does not return any value. Sorry, in publish mutation. Oh, okay, sorry. So publish mutation. If I read the question again, can you type draft consumer resolver as a post? Can you point out the line, uh, Bartek? Uh, if you see it on the screen right now, the line number. Ah, line 46 maybe. Yeah, but that's, he mean, can we actually import post type generated from Prisma by Vicre? Line 46. Okay, oh so yeah, I see. One. Yeah, yeah, that's super interesting. Okay, yeah. Um, maybe we can spend a bit of time here uh, talking about that. Um, so what you are referring to is what we call um, backing types. And we, so uh, yeah, I hope I, I'm not gonna confuse uh, everyone here. Um, so for now we are using an in-memory database. Uh, and, and so far we haven't been, um, like, like, like you saw, we haven't been defining any type annotation, right? We, we have not defined a, a post type. Right. There is no type post somewhere um, and we can actually do it. Let's try and see what, what it would look like. So a post would be uh, a type number, a uh, title uh, would be a type string and body a type string and publish a type boolean. Then we could even go ahead and say that RDB is an array of posts, right? Then we could type RDB here and there we go. Um, now, by default, when you do not um, use type annotations, and so far it's not used yet, but if you do not define type annotations, then Nexus will try to infer automatically based on the field that you defined, um, the type of a post, if that makes sense. However, there are cases where actually uh, that, that doesn't work. So let's say for instance that what you have in your database is the following. Th this is what you have in your da database, which means a, a post with an ID, a title, body, and a published field. But let's say that in your GraphQL API, you do not want to expose that field. Now Nexus um, can no longer infer um, that a post has a published field. So the way you solve that issue is by setting what we call a root type. Um, so you can come here, whoops. So is it exported? Nope, it's not. If I export that type, hopefully, there we go. Um, now I can refer to the TypeScript type that I've defined in here. And what I say is, the value that you will receive in, in your fields here. So if I do again, like t dot um, boolean, and let's say I call it differently. So not published, but is published. Now the parent field, if you look at his type, that's, that's a post. And that type here is the one that we've defined here. So now I can safely access root.published. And to answer your initial question, now that I have defined that type, yes, I can now also say, hey, my draft is of type post. Now, typically, because here we have an in-memory database, so the types, if we were to define them, and so far we've been kind of hacking everything because we've, we've, we've been just using the TypeScript inference, but typically these types 
are not defined manually because these types are what's stored in your database. And so um, they should be generated based on your GraphQL schema. You don't want to maintain all of these types manually. And there are tools to do that. Um, in our case, just after, we will be using Prisma and we'll show how you don't have to define any of these types and, and how the, the root types that I've been mentioning here are set automatically for you. I hope that um, that answers your question, uh, Bartek, and hope that, that, yeah, that it made sense. And another thing I can add on to that um, yep. is the, there are two parts. So you've talked about how this uh, root typing that we can manually put to teach Nexus about um, the, the underlying type here. That's, that's one part. And then we'll see how Prisma can kind of automate, the Prisma plugin can kind of automate that and make sure that the types coming from your database that Nexus knows about it. But the other part is the sort of more subtle, sort of like a code, code refactoring potential use case where in your resolver, but it could be anywhere in your code base, you may want to sort of type some code uh, for auto completion or, or what have you, where you're not in the context um, of like here you're on line 13, you already have the root context not published and so everything is fine. But if you're somehow creating new types, new values, and you want to type them, um, it is possible with Prisma to actually import all these types. So you would be able to get a hold of, um, say, the post type as defined in your database schema. You'd be able to import that TypeScript type thanks to how Prisma works and be able to annotate some code in your GraphQL uh, API code base. Um, that, so it's sort of a slightly separate use case depending on how you factor your code. But, uh, but yeah, both are, are, are going to be possible. And uh, maybe we can show actually importing those types a bit later as well to tie the loop there. Yep. But cool. cool. Um, I hope that answered your question. I think I saw, okay, you just um, marked it as answered, right? Yeah. Okay, cool. Let's do a, a refresh here if anyone uh, has forgotten to. Just let's check the uh, hands raised here. Um, and see if we're if we're getting toward a fifty percent mark not mark here or not. Um, let's see the chat as well. So we are at 40 attendees who raised their hand. Um, I guess 41. If if some of you are like in the rush right now trying to finish it, please uh, send a message so that like we give you five five more minutes. If none of you are in such a rush, then we'll assume. Um, that's that's enough. And as always, uh, you can you can just check out the next chapter. Yeah, I'm having issues as a deep code one. Yeah, okay. Um, I think a lot of people are going through that uh, right yeah. now. Um, that's not right. I think the reason you are going um, over that issue is because if if you if you remove all the types here, so let's go back to what we had. If as, and that's the problem of the tutorial, so nothing wrong you're doing on your hand. Uh, I think, yeah. If you remove the um, post that is in the DB, um, then what happens is that, um, well, the context can no longer infer the type of the DB. And because of that, you're having errors here telling you that published uh, is of type never. Um, so that's that's actually a, a bug on our side. It's an issue. Uh, well, not a bug, but a problem of the tutorial. So I think the way you should do it, and I know it's not ideal, sorry about that. Um, the way you should do it is revert this change here so that TypeScript um, 
can infer the type of post again. Wait for the type errors to go away, like now. Then, and the reason it's fine is because just after we'll get rid of, of this in-memory database, which is really just here to um, make it simple at first. Then if you remove that object, but you do not run Nexus Dev again, um, you should be able to run the test because now the types are fine. They should be. Uh, well, I have an error here. Let's go. Oh, sorry, another error. Now we should be good. And we're no longer, well, why are they? So the domain is published. Yeah, sure, all right. So you can see how actually the test here is, is crashing. And the reason is because I've made modification here. I changed the field. So it's no longer published, it's called is published. So the query could not be sent. Let's go ahead again. Arm dev. And probably this error, because it's tied to something that we're about to improve and make go away yep. with regards yep. to the uh, flow. Absolutely, um, yeah. We'll probably just, let's um, once, yeah, finish up here and then we could probably just uh, upgrade the whole thing anyway. Yep, and camera test. This time it should run. There we go. All right, if you are stuck on that error, this is an issue on our side with the tutorial. Um, you shouldn't have that error if we had defined proper types, basically, but because we, we didn't, uh, you end up with type errors when you remove um, the element from your DB. So it doesn't matter as we are about to add Prisma to um, the uh, API. So as always, I will just discard everything. If you are late now, just check out next chapter and let's get going. So persisting data via Prisma, all right. So there's quite a lot that is said here. Uh, we mostly talk about plugins um, because Nipsis has a, a plugin system. Plugin system brings quite a, a lot to the table for Nipsis. Um, they, <clears throat> um, they enable three type of, of things. Um, the first one is uh, they add additional behaviors to the runtime, really the runtime uh, part of your application, such as, for instance, we'll see in the case of, of Prisma, we add the client to your GraphQL context. So you don't have to do it manually, we just do it for you. Um, then there is um, what we call, well, the dev time contributions or work time. Um, and what we do here, for instance, is give you custom workflows to handle your migrations for Prisma. And finally, uh, we have the test time um, dimension contributions of, of plugins. And what this does is remember how we, we have this test context here. Well, plugins can enhance this test context to provide additional values. Um, in this case for Prisma, we, we want to have access to the client during testing. So we add the Prisma client as well. And we'll see everything uh, all about that later. So um, let's go ahead and, and just see how we um, add a plugin, enable it, and, and then use it. And what we'll do is basically replace our memory database with, with the plugin. OK, so first things, let's Let's uh, install Nexus plugin Prisma. So the Prisma plugin bundles uh, a couple of stuff. Um, it bundles the Prisma client and it bundles um, the Prisma CLI. So you sh 
are not supposed to install your own version of the CLI in the client in there. Okay. Once the plugin is installed, um, we can remove our database. So let's delete that file. Let's remove pretty much everything about it here. And let's import it. There we have our plugin. And the way you enable plugins in Nexus is by using our top level use function, a bit like Express, very similar, uh, which then allows you to um, pass in your plugin and that's, that's it. You've just enabled Prisma plugin. So now that it's enabled, uh, we also need to do uh, a bit of stuff on, on the Prisma side um, to um, create your database, connect it, et cetera, et cetera. So <clears throat> let's create a Prisma folder. <coughs> Sorry. <coughs> let's create a Prisma folder and not, and then let's create a schema.prisma file. So one thing here, um, the tutorial mentions um, the usage of Postgres for convenience because we are a bit concerned that not all of you have Docker or some easy way to um, set up a Postgres database. We will be using SQLite. If you do have Docker uh, installed, then please uh, follow the tutorial using Postgres. If you don't, then um, yeah, follow what I'll be doing. It's, there are very minor differences between setting up a Postgres and SQLite database with Prisma. Um, just that with SQLite, uh, you don't have to set up anything. It's just a file that will be created on your file system. So uh, first thing we need to do is define a data source. Um, we need to give it a name. So let's call it uh, SQLite, doesn't matter. Uh, as a provider, we'll say SQLite, and the URL to your database um, will be uh, an environment variable uh, that will call database URL. All right, now we will create an M file and define that environment variable. Oh, sorry, <clears throat> yes, that environment variable. And for SQLite, that will be file dev.db. Cool. So, when we run the Prisma client, uh, sorry, the Prisma CLI to um, um, migrate our database, for instance, um, the CLI will read the environment variable, replace it here. And so that also enables you to um, switch from your database between um, development and production later if you need to change it from the environment variable. Okay. Um, once that is done, um, I guess we are ready to start creating our schema. Um, I'll copy past it. Well, I, well, I can write it. It's fine. So um, <clears throat> right now we have only one object type. It's a post. So um, that's what we'll have in our database as well. And we'll model our database schema. So an ID, uh, sorry, a post has an ID. Um, and um, the, the ID is auto uh, incremented. Um, it has a title of type string, has a body of type string, and it has a published field of type boolean. Once that is done, um, we will run, um, we will use the Prisma CLI to apply the migration. So this is always done in two steps. The first step is to create a migration file. And to do that, we will use the, um, well, Prisma CLI uh, with the Prisma migrate save command. So dash dash experimental. Okay, so it's downloading Prisma engine. Okay, uh, in here, do I want to create the SQLi database? Yes, um, I need to give a name to my migration. It doesn't really matter, call it init or whatever you like. There we go. Now this has created a bunch of files, <clears throat> which are essentially, um, data that will then tell um, the Prisma CLI what migrations it needs to apply. Um, so once this is done, uh, we run the second command, which is Prisma migrate up. 
and this will apply the migrations based on these styles that you've just written before. There we go. This is not intended. You should not download the gen every time. All right, doesn't matter. We now have a dev.db file, as you can see here. Uh, that's our SQLite <coughs> database. Um, and we are pretty much ready, I believe. Um, we're pretty much ready to start using the Prisma CLI, uh, sorry, the Prisma plugin. So let's run the dev command. Uh, we're gonna have a bunch of errors. Well, that one was not in, uh, intended. Uh, oh, sorry, I run, ah, npm run dev, not npx. So we have a live error. It doesn't look like fun to debug. <clears throat> um, it looks Should like- Should we try a, a uh, RMRF no modules and a reinstall? Yeah, so it looks like the hash is not like, it looks like we have two engine somehow and the hash are not the same. So, and, and, you, and we've saw that it's been done loading several times the engine. I don't know what's going on. I mean, we have, we have had the error several times already here. Um, mm. <clears throat> uh, we could do that indeed. But At that least as the first steps. Yeah. So let me try query engine. I, mean, I hope that you folks won't have to do that, uh, but it's pretty likely. So there is nothing here, CLI. Oh. Okay. Uh, let me try to reinstall everything, but this is going to take a while. This was going so smoothly so far. It had to happen. Had to happen. Are we on um, uh, version 2.0 here, or are we on 2. Uh, <clears throat> I think 2. we are on two. Yeah, um, I think we are on 2.10. Q11, actually. Okay. And yeah, we are having the very same errors. I'm wondering whether this has nothing to do with latest version, I can try something. Um, so one thing we might want to try, uh, it's good you have another idea, but maybe uh, maybe at one point you're in resolutions forcing uh, either 201 yeah. or something like that, but yeah. Yeah, let's, let's try it. But there is quite a lot of dependencies too. Um, uh, so we have add Prisma client, uh, this should be two, um, let's put it to 200. We have the CLI. Um, do we have anything else? SD SDK? Yes. Yes, that's it. And we'll need to uh, just switch for for the time being from NPM to Yarn, obviously.
Um, so while Fabian's uh, running oh, this. <clears throat> so wait, yeah. wait a second. Um, Harshit is helping me in the background, telling me that maybe uh, it's just my Prisma cache that is corrupted. So oh. that, I would love for, for that to be the reason. Um, and he's telling me to do the following that cache Prisma. Oh, please, let it be the reason. Okay, <laughs> let's try again. I'm sorry, uh, folks, for uh, this. So while this is running, um, I'll just maybe take a, a quick moment to point out um, a little bit what's going on here. Also, high level, like we bundle dependencies with uh, the Prisma plugin. And we actually also do that with Nexus on other types of dependencies, like GraphQL, for example, package. Uh, and so the strategy has been written about in our uh, meta architecture page. We have sort of a, what, what's our opinion and, and why do we bundle like this? Um, and so one of the reasons is to help like avoid pain like this actually. We run uh, integration tests on Nexus Prisma uh, and make sure that uh, the SDK, CLI, um, the TypeScript version and everything, and we basically run system tests that are actually creating new projects, uh, installing um, the Prisma plugin, getting uh, Postgres running, and we do it for all the different types of databases. So we kind of do what a user would do basically. Um, and we make sure all this is, so generally speaking, the uh, stability that you end up getting rather than having, you know, uh, potentially like seven or so packages that, that all have to kind of work just right. Uh, we, we take care of integrating those. In the past, we've had problems, for example, with uh, TypeScript, when TypeScript 3.9 came out, there were some subtle problems with the type gen that was uh, created by Nexus Prisma so that it just broke. And it broke in a very internal way, so you would get errors as a user really not understanding what's going on. Um, but by bundling TypeScript in these things, we make sure we integrate and fix these things before it gets to you. Um, so we write a lot, a lot more detail in our in our docs about about the strategy that we have. Um, but yeah. I am. Um, I hope this has fixed it. I think it did. Um, there is one bad news. Well, let, let me first see whether that works. Oh, it does. Awesome. So good news is this is fixed. Bad news is if uh, some of you are using NPM, uh, I'm sorry. Uh, I, maybe this is not going to crash for you, but it looks like it's very likely as this is uh, looks like a bug in the latest Prisma version. And the only way to fix it right now is to use the yarn resolutions feature to fix um, the Prisma version to a lower version. So if you are using NPM, you won't be able to take advantage of that. And so, uh, yeah, it's very likely to crash for you as well. If you okay. are using Yarn, though, um, it works fine for me on NPM too. Okay, I had any yeah. issues on so NPM. We have, some, or... we have some reports that it's going okay. So. Okay, so maybe it's just something wrong with my environment. Okay, well, super glad to uh, see that it's working for everyone. All right then, so let's get uh, moving. Sorry about that. Um, what we were doing just before was um, we were about to replace our in-memory in -memory database with um, um, Prisma. And as I mentioned in the past, um, the Nexus plugin Prisma actually already um, passes the DB, um, well, the Prisma client to your GraphQL context. And you can see here that the DB is already an instance of the Prisma client. Uh, and hence why we have errors here as the API is not exactly the same. So um, we'll go ahead and, and just re replace um, the old statements with uh, a usage of, 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 the, of the Prisma client. So let's go ahead, ctx.db. It's gonna be pretty straightforward. Um, here, uh, if you've never used the Prisma client, um, you'll get to discover the APIs I type. Uh, it's very intuitive in my opinion. Um, here, what we want is um, we want to find all the posts which are not published again. So we'll use the find many uh, API and we'll say where um, published is false. Um, and that essentially mimics exactly what we were doing before, except we're now talking to a proper database. Uh, we can copy past that here uh, for the post and say, uh, yeah, published true. That's it for these two. Uh, queries, um, and then 
for uh, the create draft. Um, so we no longer need um, to generate the ID because the database will do it for us. Um, so all we need to do is remove that um, <clears throat> and then use the Prisma client to create um, a post. So let's do that. Uh, counts. Uh, wait, no, actually. So const is let's call it results. Context.db.post.create. Um, the create method expects uh, some data. Um, we can see here what it expects, which is pretty much exactly what we've passed here. So we, we could like just remove the draft here and pass it here. All right, uh, once that's done, let's now rename up the draft. <clears throat> and there we go, type errors are done. Um, when we create a draft, we now um, create it in the database, we persist it and we return it. Next step, for the publish, um, uh, we are actually going to remove all of that as this is not needed anymore. All we need is to perform an update in the database. So we'll go ahead and just say um, <clears throat> db.post. Update. So we want to update a post. We want to update which post will the one that has the ID that we passes in um, argument. And the field that we want to update is the published one. And the value that we want to set it to is true. So when we publish, we um, try to update a draft ID where uh, its ID is, is what we've passed, and we set the, the published from false to true. And I mean, that's that's pretty much it. We've, we've completely replaced our in-memory database with Prisma here. I think it's very intuitive um, to use. These are admittedly very simple use cases. I, I, I know that, like, um, thankfully, Prisma can handle that, but um, where this is going to get interesting is is really on the testing part just after. So maybe let's let's try. Uh, it's been a long time that we haven't shared <clears throat> our playground. Uh, we can try running a couple of, of queries again. So let's make sure that we can still create a draft. Yes, we can. Um, then we have access to the list of drafts again. Once we have that draft, we can try to publish it. So draft ID one, we publish it. And then once it's published, we have it under the list of posts. There we go. And we no longer have it under the drafts. Um, yeah, that's, that's it for this chapter. Um, we are running out of time. Uh, I do not mind at all uh, continuing. So I don't plan on, on uh, just like we don't plan on quitting the workshop. If you um, have to go. Um, sorry for being uh, a bit late. Um, if you want to continue, though, um, we'll just go straight till the end of, of the workshop. We have um, a couple questions so far about uh, publishing a recorded version after. Um, the Prisma Day workshop recordings have not been uh, committed to be published, but uh, it's quite possible they will be. So we'll have that on our, I'm sure, Prisma's Twitter feed as well, but Nexus uh, for our workshop, if it, if it gets uh, made public, we'll definitely post it there. So if you do have to drop off, uh, hopefully we'll get it published and, and you'll be able to find that. Cool. Um, as if you have any questions related to that chapter, so as always, we'll wait again 15 to 20 minutes. <clears throat> if you have any questions related to that chapter and errors, I guess post it into the chat. Um, I'll look into it. And for the Q&A, the other type of questions, I'll just, um, yeah, we're yeah. going to answer some of them now. So there's one here um, that I'll, I'll uh, jump on about, tell us about nullable. So pretty open-ended. Yeah. Um, there is a uh, schema guide uh, section to our Nexus docs. And on that section, we've got two, on that page, uh, the schema guide, there's two sections about nullability. There's uh, nullability in principle and nullability in Nexus. So we separate thinking about it uh, from GraphQL's point of view 
and then and then sort of how to think about it with Nexus, how the API is modeled and stuff like that, and what the defaults are. Um, this is highly recommended reading. Uh, it kind of tells you everything and more that I could tell you right now. Um, the sort of TLDR though, uh, with regard to global defaults, is that Nexus will make all of your output types by default nullable, and all of your input types um, by default also nullable. So this approach means, from a client point of view, everything they query by default will always result in data that may actually not be there, right? If we're talking TypeScript, the types would be null or uh, the actual value. So this is the default behavior, and there's various reasons for that to be the default. Um, you can, as an API author in Nexus, change the global default and make everything in your schema default to be, uh, let's call it guaranteed, so not nullable. Um, and there may be valid reasons to do that as well. If you have very uh, high confidence in your uh, system that like you don't have, like a microservice architecture that can have a lot of partial failure, um, that might be a case where you don't want to make, the, you want to support some things being, uh, it should usually work, but it may not work. And uh, if, it, if it doesn't work, well, there's going to be a null, but the rest of the data will still be there. Um, but if you're in a situation where you do have very high confidence, maybe it makes sense to, to default the other way around. Um, so, but do check out the nullability sections uh, in the guide. And there's some links there to additional articles and books uh, that, that go even deeper. So, um, yeah. Um, there's a question from James Gatz at the top here. How would you type a resolver function? Um, is there an example in the docs? So the default behavior of Nexus uh, as you write resolvers is that they're all automatically typed and that's certainly one of the core value propositions. Um, maybe James, you can comment on your own question if you're, if you're hearing this uh, and just clarify what the use case here is. Are you looking to have a resolver function, for example, extracted in an isolated uh, place where you want to be able to type it? Um, if so, um, then I believe uh, Flavion can show you how to do this with the get gen types. It's a bit more advanced. Yeah, extract and type it, gotcha. So there is, uh, it's a bit more advanced, but there is uh, the uh, sort of global types from Nexus that you can get a hold of. I don't know if Flavian, we can we can whip that up right now. Um, yep, uh, we can. I'm just cool. uh, trying to see how we do it again. Um, so let's let's try to do that. Um, let's say we want to um, <clears throat> extract the resolver of the draft um, field here, um, and so we want to extract the type of of that thing. And we actually see it here, right? It's a field resolver, and it takes two generics that are. This is a bit technical, so if you're not familiar with TypeScript, don't worry, uh, it's fine. What you could is always do is not care about it, copy past that return type and use it. Then how you do it is you say code draft resolver. Um, you assign its type here. So there we're gonna have an error uh, to find the type. You can, so um, there's, yeah, it's, it's there's a bit of friction here. Um, these types are still only av available on um, the underlying library that powers Nexus framework, uh, which is called Nexus Schema. But you should be able to import that type from um, Nexus components, yeah. Yep, from the schema here. And from that, you should have access to something called core, and that should allow you to type your resolver. There we go. So now, um, you can already see that you get the typings, you get the roots, art, context, and you also get the return type. So now if I return something, there we go, you get the auto completion. Yep. So That's all it. you need to do is use the field resolver type and then you use the um, um, generics here to say which type and which field of that type you want to extract the resolver from. And James Gatz looks like he's happy. <laughs> okay. Awesome. That's great. Cool. Um, let's do a quick uh, check in here. So if you have uh, gotten, if you've synced up to the end of this chapter now, uh, just do a little hand raise on Zoom and, and we'll see how we're, how we're uh, doing.
I'm looking to see if we have any Prisma specific integration questions so far uh, in the Q&A here. So uh, a question from uh, Abdullah um, about migrations from Nexus Prisma version 1.34 and which means Prisma 1 to Prisma 2 and uh, this, this version of Nexus and uh, the, the, the Prisma plugin. So um, the question's about, is there like, what's, what's the migration process here? So for um, the, there's sort of two, two migration paths here that we need to consider. So there's a, there's a one on the, Nexus, on the Prisma websites uh, that goes through the process of upgrading from Prisma 1 to Prisma 2. And that's very thorough. Um, I'm not an expert in that content, but uh, it's, it's got multiple sections and I think is a pretty pretty end-to-end um, -end, uh, guide on getting the, uh, so, oh, and there's a tool to do, yeah. So not only on the, yeah, not only on the Prisma website is there a whole section uh, dedicated, like a, 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 on the nav, it's actually on the nav uh, section for uh, migrating, but then uh, we have a tool, uh, looks like in beta, I guess, it's quite new, um, that will yep. help up, uh, automa automate the upgrade path from Prisma 1 to Prisma 2. Now for Nexus Prisma, the plugin, uh, the but there's, there's path, another, there's another uh, path also to migrate from Prisma 1 to Prisma 2 that I want to mention. Um, oh yeah, go for it. Um, so you have, yeah, you have two paths. First is using that tool, which is super beta uh, and, and also still does not support um, some pretty important use cases, uh, like oh, relations are pretty much not supported. So um, yeah, it's um, honestly still not really an option to use that tool. Another way though uh, that works pretty well is just to use the Prisma introspection um, feature. So what you do is, so like you have your existing Prisma schema um, along with its database schema. And so you use Prisma 2 to introspect your Prisma 1 database. This is going to generate a schema um, with um, the Prisma 2 um, notation. From there, there will be stuff that won't exactly match your previous, uh, the previous API that was generated with your Prisma 1 uh, schema. Stuff like relations, for instance. Um, rel relations will be um, uppercase. So all you need to do is just manually make the modifications to go back to your previous uh, API. So relations now are purely virtual. You can name them however you want. It doesn't matter. It's not stored in the database. So you just name them however you want in a way that matches, um, um, sorry, uh, the old Prisma client API that you had. And once you're done at that, then you can um, moving forward, use Prisma Migrate. If, if you want to use it, if you want to use Prisma Migrate, given that it's experimental. So if you're fine uh, using that, uh, you can do so, or then use Nex or whatever other tool you want to use to do your migration. Um, and that should, that should allow you, allow you sorry, to, to migrate from Prisma 1 to Prisma 2. One last thing, Harshit, uh, which is um, someone that works at Prisma, tells me that tool actually that tool is actually working alongside with introspection. It fixes the inconsistencies and assumptions that Prisma 1 makes about certain things. All right, okay, so my bad. So actually the path is to use introspection regardless, and then you can use that tool to fix what I was telling you to fix manually. Hopefully that makes sense. So, and that's about Prisma, uh, and then I'll let you finish what you were saying, sorry, uh, Jason. Yeah, uh, just about the migration guide for um, Nexus Prisma itself. And uh, I'll post it back as a link in chat later. I can't quite find it right now. This if you know offhand where that is. Um, but I know actually, and I think even you wrote it at one point, but it's been quite a while, but it talked about how to migrate from a uh, Prisma 1 version of Nexus Prisma to a Prisma 2 version of Nexus Prisma. And it wasn't too complicated. I think the bulk of the work here is definitely gonna be more on the, the Prisma 1 to two, uh, okay. the next, the Prisma plugin itself will be, I think, a lot, a lot easier, relatively. Um, yeah, I don't remember uh, where that uh, doc is, and I'm not even sure. Yeah, 
I, I, I cannot find that document um, right now. Um, that being said, there are substantial differences uh, between Nexus Prisma 1 and Nexus Prisma 2. Um, yeah. It, it depends really on how um, how many advanced use cases you are doing with Nexus Prisma 1. There is a lot of stuff that, that's gone now, uh, such as um, if you knew about it, see that Prisma type, this is no longer possible. Yeah, um, I, and, I just uh, found the migration guide and posted it in okay. chat. Yeah, okay. it's in the release notes. It's quite old, but it should still be valid. Um, and it talks about migrating from 0.3x. Okay, I see an interesting other question. Uh, is, is the answer uh, done then? I think so, yeah. So um, I just saw an interesting one, which was in the Prisma workshop, we saw you could run raw SQL using the Prisma client since Prisma is not good with aggregated queries like counts. Can we do that here? Do we have access to the Prisma client raw SQL abilities? Um, yes. <clears throat> um, yes, yes, yes. And to do that, um, here on the DB, you do have access to the row um, um, functions. So yeah, you can do pretty much uh, everything you want. Also, one, one thing to note, if for whatever reason you need to um, have access to the client outside of um, the context of your GraphQL API, uh, you're still free to import uh, the client yourself. Uh, like that. Okay, we have a type error. Looks like the Prisma client is not generated. But it is. I don't know why this is the case, but usually you should be able to import the client from here. Uh, and instantiate it yourself, just like you would usually do um, with Prisma. And then you can pass uh, that client here. So instance, DB, and there you go. And now you are passing your own instance of the client to the plugin, and you can also freely just use it wherever you want. Um, this is also great if you need to, um, I don't know, access a client to have a seed script, for, for instance. So hopefully that answers your question. So answer live, done. Okay, let's maybe move on. <clears throat> yep. Participants, we, yeah, there's quite a lot of people who've been moving. We have only 23, 24 now, people who raised their hand. Um, didn't see a lot of people asking questions in the chat, so I assume Everything's been fine, although I doubt it for some reason. <laughs> <laughs> but it's all right. We're getting, we're definitely getting on time. So we can, uh, maybe people have entered into a watch mode as well, and that's all right. Yep. Um, so the next up is going to be uh... testing. And, and this, this is a, a short chapter as well. Yeah. So um, if you are still trying to follow along, uh, it's been quite long, so it's fine if you aren't anymore. Uh, we are now entering chapter six. So if you want to, um, <clears throat> if you want to, sorry, uh, do the chapter six, you need to check out the branch named chapter dash five, um, as we've been doing so far. All right. So. Last chapter, um, this is about testing with Prisma. Um, uh, there's quite a lot of stuff to do here. Well, not so much, it's fine. So uh, let's get going. How do we do testing with Prisma? Um, so as we did not yet fully really, as we do not fully support testing with Prisma, we do, but it's not fully integrated. Uh, there is quite some stuff that you need to do manually. Um, and among that, you need to use um, what we call a, a custom jest environment. And, and I'll, I'll explain to you what this is. So we'll start by doing that. Uh, we'll create a Nexus test environment such as file. And I am going to copy the whole environment uh, to move a bit faster, and I'll explain what it's doing. 
there we go. Um, if people want to have access to that environment, uh, there is the link. All right. So what this environment is going to do is basically, um, like, because we're doing system testing and because now we are connected to database, we need to be able to spawn a new database on every test so that we ensure that we're starting from a clean database. So what this environment does <clears throat> really is for each test, it's going to um, migrate our database based on um, a cust like a, a generated database, um, one that has a, um, a random name here. So for every test, we are going to generate a database with a random name. We are going to migrate that database. Then we will run um, queries against our API that is connected to that database. And once our test is done, then we simply um, delete that file. Um, this is actually a um, tweaked version from the tutorial because the tutorial is using Postgres. So if you think this is only going to work with SQLite because it's like just a file, um, it's it's not the case. Uh, we do have solutions even with Postgres as a as a proper hosted database, and you can do exactly the same. So once we have that environment set, what we need to do is to point Jest to that environment, and we'll do so um, <clears throat> by just pointing. It with a path. So Nexus test environment Um I am realizing that the tutorial is missing something, which is to tell you to install the Nanoid um, dependency here. So we'll we'll do it uh, now. npm install minus save dev <coughs> Nanoid, uh, which is just a small library to generate um, um, ideas. Once this is done, um, there is very little thing we'll need to update. Um, and I'll show it to you once it's installed. So as I've told you before, um, the Nexus plugin does a couple of things. It enhance your runtime uh, by passing the client, for instance, to the contest. It also enhances the CLI, which we call the death time uh, dimension by, um, and I'm just seeing that I've, I've used NPM and now it's, <laughs> I'm stupid. I, I am now using uh, Yarn and I need to keep using Yarn to fix the, the version. Um, ah. All right, so it also enhances the CLI, and last but not least, it also uh, enhances the test context. And it does so by passing a DB uh, property to the context you have here. And what we want to do basically is make sure that after our test, we stop the connection to the database. And this is pretty much the only thing that we need to do. I'm just waiting for the completion here, uh, which is not here because I've just reinstalled everything. And all right, let me restart uh, TypeScript. There we go. App.db.client.disconnect. Um, all right. Um, cool. So that's, that's it normally. Uh, we should be able to run our test now. Let's try and let's see whether it, it fails or not. Okay, so we have a failure. Okay, because I still haven't installed actually Nanoid. So let's do it again. Okay, let's run them again. Fingers crossed. This is a bit too long. Very topical uh, from Kyle question about how do we update the just test to reset the DB before each run? Otherwise the snapshots don't work because the IDs increment. 
Um, this is um, done thanks to the test environment, right? Um, the test environment ensures that you create a database uh, for each test. And the test is not running. Should I maybe just try again? You can see here that it does create a database, but for whatever reason, it just uh, gets stuck and doesn't move on. Let me see if I've done something wrong. <clears throat> Nope, I have absolutely no feedback whatsoever. Do you have an idea? Shot, but uh, not a good one. Um, you, when you ran this earlier, was it with Postgres? Um, so the hunch here being, is there is it possible that the switch to SQL uh, Lite has thrown off something? Nope, it was working before. Okay. Um, I can as well. Um, and as well try something. Because it's starting to get long. I'm just gonna keep that. We are going to revert everything and we are going to check out chapter six. Solution. Are they running now? Yarn test. We have our DB running. But then nothing happens. <clears throat> That's a great idea. Other question. Other question is um, when when you were running before, was the version of Prisma 2.1 or was it maybe something like 2.0? I think it was with 2.0. Two no. So uh, I can see that a lot of people have um, a known bug right now, uh, which is that the DB um, property uh, does not appear in their context. Uh, we're about to fix that very soon. Um, the reason is the way we provide the typings is by copy passing over some typings here. Um, uh, yeah, it's actually not here uh, on the post install. So when you install other libraries, sometimes npm or yarn, yarn um, fails and you don't get the type. Uh, what I can, uh, meanwhile, well, until we fix the problem, what I can advise you is to just run um, yarn on npm based on what you use, uh, doesn't matter. Yarn add or npm install, and you install the plugin again. This should make sure to re um, run the post install script and uh, so that your types are properly copied over. Uh, we'll very soon just um, get rid of that um, post install script and, and do it programmatically to always ensure it's here. Sorry about that. The tests are not running. I don't know what to do about it at this point. Um, I would love to get it working and to show you. Um, but I have I'm running on my side error. to just see if I can if I can reproduce or not. And uh, Harshit, yeah, that's a good point. So um, might as well. Let's throw in a debug star uh, environment variable, see if there's any more feedback there, just in case. Yep. But I have a feeling we won't have anything here. It's really weird that we have nothing like. It's just tough. So I just ran with NPM and I had the test pass. Um, it's running for you locally. 
yeah, I just did a checkout of chapter six, NPM install, NPM test, pass. Do you maybe want to take over for the last chapter? <laughs> um, let me try to reinstall everything once. If it doesn't work, I'll just let you sh yeah. screen share and I'll let you. Uh... So what I'll do also is set up the live share right now. So it's ready. Basically, uh, I'll have the sharing and the environment, but you can drive the code. Does that sound? That's fair. Yeah. That way at least you can keep your flow. Okay, yeah, it's not working. Again, sorry, folks. Uh, don't know what's going on on my laptop. It might be working on yours, actually. Um, but it's not here. So I will stop sharing. Let Jason actually uh, take over. Actually, is it since it's live sharing? Oh yeah, yeah, uh, uh, yeah. Sure, sure. Yeah, yeah. Good idea. All right. So I'll just switch. You'd be using my RAM and CPU uh, remotely. Screen sharing. <laughs> it's a lot of inception, but. So, just want to sign in. Um, Okay, let me bring that back here. Okay, you should be able to see it again. Um, and so you were saying that your tests were passing, so let's try. <clears throat> yeah, with NPM. Request with write access. All right, granted. NPM run test. We're actually at the very end. There is one last thing that we need to do. Okay, so there we go. It works. Um, I was saying before how uh, system tests can be super convenient because they do not care at all about the underlying implementation. Uh, we've just showed how uh, switching completely the database engine or layer, as you could call it. Um, still requires no refactor to keep this test running. There is one last thing that uh, we've added here, uh, and that was on, on, the, on the checked out branch. Um, the only thing that we couldn't test, or that we did not test before, is uh, ensuring that the data was actually properly persisted on the database. So here, to recap, we are creating a draft, then we are publishing the draft. So before we didn't ensure that the, that draft was uh, properly persisted. Now, what we can do as well, thanks to the plugin, is access our DB instance here, query all the posts, and then uh, snapshot it. So for whatever reason, it's, it's a, a natural snapshot, <clears throat> but we, uh, which is very similar to an inline snapshot if you're not familiar, uh, except that it's, it's put in a file instead of inline in your code. Um, and we can see here that we, we do get an array uh, with uh, one uh, draft that was published, and it's true. Um, and um, yeah, that's that's pretty much it for, for that chapter. Um, to recap a bit, we just need to uh, have our uh, custom environment. This is temporarily, we hope, uh, a bit like for the test context, we are waiting for a bit, of, a bit more feedback to see what we could um, do here to simplify all of that. Once we feel like we have enough feedback and enough use cases, uh, we might, um, yeah, probably bundle this environment uh, directly into Nexus or find another approach that won't um, require you to just copy past uh, this code. Um, once you have set yeah. up that test environment, um, and if you do not have that DB type bug that will be gone uh, very soon. Um, yeah, you should just be able to run your tests as before. Uh, and you can just add this new test here to ensure that the posts were persisted. 
that's that's pretty much it for chapter six. Awesome. So, Fabiol, there's this is uh, at the point now where the tutorial on the website uh, concludes, yep. right? We've got a chapter seven on off where we're still work in progress, but you've got some sort of um, like you pushed ahead on that for the workshop. Um, we we have our hard stop at two, uh, so sorry, my time too, uh, in about 25 minutes. So, I suggest we do not do um, the authentication we've part. We've got a lot. Okay, because I was thinking we've got a bunch of questions as well that we could maybe focus yep. on instead. So um, especially because the authentication part is also everyone can check out chapter seven anyway. If, if is that correct, Fabio? Um, no, uh, if people want to check correct. out chapter seven on the uh, repo, that's uh, not okay. correct. Um, I haven't done chapter seven because I was um, planning to do it um, just myself live. Uh, what you can okay. do, however, is um, let me find tutorial. Um, there's a branch or a PR. <clears throat> it's not ideal yet, uh, but it will be once we come up with. Um, um, the, the chapter properly written down. Um, I am going to send you two links. This is um, basically the code that will be used for uh, chapter seven um, until we find better ways to do authentication and authorization. And then there is also in here, uh, in the examples, you have actually uh, two examples that are using um, community plugins, um, one that you might actually know, which is called um, GraphQL Shield, and it uses that to handle authorization. So Nexus Framework has a plugin um, to work with GraphQL Shield, and you might want to check that out as well to see how, how it works. Is that on your screen right now, Fabio? Um, <laughs> no, it's not, sorry. But I, I, sent, I sent the two links. <laughs> um, and the examples repo is here. And you, okay. you have the plugins Prisma and JWT and Shield and plugin Prisma and JWT on. Yeah. Um, so, because what I was thinking then is um, we can maybe focus uh, the remaining time on yep. uh, trying to get through some Q&A. Um, another thing that I think you, you maybe already mentioned is just how the auth is not such a what we what we have available today is uh, the plugins are there as well, but uh, it's a lot of kind of non-core stuff. So we've kind of reached the end of, of core features for the frame uh, for the purposes of the uh, workshop. So maybe it's a good time, given given what we have left, to do Q. Um, I also want to, uh, as some people might. Uh, start to drop off and, and say bye. And it's been awesome to have you. I just want to share a link uh, now then um, with the uh, feedback uh, portal that you can leave uh, any feedback you have. So just putting that in chat now. Um, it'd be amazing if it takes maybe 30 seconds or 60 seconds, uh, uh, more time if you want to write more, that's awesome too. But, but yeah, if any feedback you have would be amazing for us. So drop that in chat um, and just, yeah, uh, if you could do that uh, at your convenience, that'd be amazing. All right, so Q and A. Um, did you have anything there, Flavion, you wanted to jump on yet? I mean, there is 15 left. Um, I guess let's go over them one by one. Uh, it might be that there are some that we cannot answer, but so be it. I, I yep. won't pre-read them and I'll just go ahead. So if it fits in nicely, could you cover creating your own data types and archetypes, e.g. daytime. Okay, so let me uh, very quickly share my screen again. I'm not sure I fully understand everything you're asking for, but uh, there is definitely some stuff um, that I can show you. So two things. First, um, about daytime. So I know this is not what you're asking for, but just for your interest, um, wait, I need our interest. So daytime and JSON tailors are um, built in into Nexus framework. So you don't have to create your own. Um, you can just use t.date or t.json. 
and you will be able to um, have validation around your dates. Um, then to answer the second question, which I think creating your own R types. So I think by R types, you refer to input object types. And for that, um, well, you use the input object type function here. So let's like, give it a name. For instance, let's say when we create the drafts, sorry, uh, let, let's move that a bit below and let's go to the create draft uh, field here. Uh, let's say instead of having these uh, two arts here, we want to encapsulate them in one object. Uh, so we could say create draft input. Um, it's exactly the same API as, as for the rest. Um, you would then do t.string title, uh, t.body, no, t.string body. And then here you would remove of them. So let's also make sure that they are required. Um, by the way, if you need, <clears throat> if you can change these defaults. If you want them required uh, all the time, or if you want to change that nullability default at, at the type level, then you can do it so uh, thanks to that thing here. So you can say inputs um, and uh, non-null default, so that would be uh, true. And uh, suddenly they, they should all be required. And then um, here you might say data and then schema.arg, and then you refer to, um, well, the type that you've just created, which is create draft inputs. And that will essentially um, now change the tab of your Rs. And so if we wait a bit, um, there we go. Um, so we now see that um, the types have changed and we need to access Rs through data. One thing though is that it's not required. So if we make it required, um, then all these null R undefined should be gone. Um, and I hope that answers your question. Maybe one uh, way to also just uh, add on there is the schema dot um, scalar type method. So yep. that's where you can uh, create your own data types as well. Uh, it's got quite a few options, so we might not dive into this right now, but just know that uh, what you get with say date uh, or JSON could, uh, although we ship it out of the box, uh, you could use this in theory to create those as well. So yep. I think, so there's one, one thing that is interesting here. Um, First, pretty much all options here are the same as GraphQL.js. Um, so if, if you know the library, the only different field is as nexus method are the in only interesting one. And what this enables to do is to achieve what we've done with t.date and t.json. So let's say you create your custom scalar. Um, then here you could say um, my custom scalar and then let's um, just do a serialize val and return val. We don't care. Um, then what now you should do, you should have hopefully, so not here, but in um, a field, see that my custom scalar. So this is, this is um, yeah, an interesting part of, of the API. And so now you are able to yep. uh, extend the DSL somehow to, to have a field of your custom scalar. Uh, so uh, next one is can we use Prisma typing in models like T dot model. So we haven't talked about T dot model at all. Um, can we use Prisma typing in models? Maybe uh, Teras, hopefully I'm pronouncing that correctly. Uh, you can clarify uh, yeah. what you mean exactly. That'd be great. Next one is any different between Nexus API versus Apollo Server. Uh, so first, first word here is yes. <laughs> um, Apollo Server uh, has a smaller scope than Nexus for sure. Uh, and we used to actually have the ability to uh, make Apollo Server be the server of Nexus if you wanted via a custom server configuration for Nexus. So we've rolled that back a bit because before we get uh, into custom servers with Nexus. We want to flesh out what the features of Nexus server are to begin with. Because any server customization is going to need to adhere to the contract uh, or rather interface that the core Nexus server has. 
so that when you do custom when you do swap in for a custom server, the doctor that's doing this swapping uh, can can fulfill the the interface. And the problem was we had this ability to swap servers, but we had so few server features that it wasn't uh, wasn't really the right order of operations from a product point of view, you could say. So I'll say that um, that uh, there is significant difference, and and uh, sub the scope of Apollo server would be a subset of what the scope of Nexus is. Um, next question. Which is another question. Uh, uh, oh, we've got an upvote here. So, Monty uh, just got here the field resolver answer. Okay, so this was about the typing uh, import uh, from from the uh, core. Uh, and and oh, it's not it's not a question. It's just a it's a kudos. Okay, thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. Um, Robin, I have a question that would be awesome to cover at some time. If point, let's see. So, the question is: Can we touch upon recursive input types when dealing with trees, uh, for example? Um, yeah, definitely. I can do that very easily. Let's let's use that input type here. Um, we are talking about input types, or yeah, in, re, um, input types. I mean, it's yeah, input types. Um, it's pretty straightforward. Um, all you have to do is um, so let, let's let's say here let's create maybe something that makes sense. Um, what could we do? Um, yeah, I mean, I don't really care. I'll just make something recursive for the sake of being recursive. It won't really make sense, but um, all you have to do is to refer to um, your type um, and make it recursive. Um, and uh, if you've been using GraphQL.js in the past, you might have encountered um, a lot of friction in regards to, um, how, how is it called? Um, secular dependencies. Um, because you are referring mostly to types with strings here, you won't have that issue, even if there's something that we haven't showed yet, but um, you can actually uh, still refer to types using some values. It has some benefits. Um, so let's say, for instance, here, create draft input. Even if you do pass create draft input here, you won't have any issues. And the reason is everything is deferred here into a function that will prevent you from um, referencing that variable before it's even created. So that alone should be enough. And we can now check the schema. Um, and so it's on the trade draft. I mean, I'm not sure if that's gonna make sense at all. Um, do we have actually something? Is it running? So wait, this is the, okay. Cannot, <laughs> that's funny. <laughs> okay, cannot reference input object trade draft input within itself through a series of non-null fields input. I'm wondering whether that's because of if you make it nullable though, uh, are we are we Yeah, that's what I'm good done. because it's logically it makes sense because you would be infinitely required to yep. pass the argument. Absolutely. So, yeah. so um, actually that, a nice I didn't ever hit this case. It's nice that they catch that. <laughs> yep. Um and yeah, there we go. Uh, we've just made it um, nullable again, and we do have here a um, re recursive input object type. Hopefully, that answers your question. And and like the answer is yes, it needs very easy. Just just reference your 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 type, and and it's just going to handle everything for you. Yep. Um, one thing, it's a bit out of scope, but I've just mentioned how uh, it it's actually useful to uh, refer to types. Um, with variables, and the reason is um, technically it doesn't change anything. Um, let's say here I refer to the post object directly. The only thing that it provides you, and we might actually solve that differently in the, in the future, but what it gives you is uh, like jump to definition. And so here we are in the same file. It's not super useful, but imagine as you you have like I don't know hundreds of types, 
being able to very easily jump to the definition of a type that, that a field refers to can be super useful. What we hope to do yeah. in the future, though, is um, with the NetSys extension that we basically provide you with the same functionality uh, by control clicking even on the string here. But for now, we don't have an extension that's for the future, but that kind of give you a glimpse of, of what we would like to achieve with the extension. Quick I tweak. hope. A yep. quick tweak on the extension, you can actually open up the uh, TS config because it's it's a feature for jump to de definition. It's a feature that comes from the language service plugin, not VS Code. So um, this would be uh, just showing that we actually have today a language service plugin for TypeScript for Nexus. And uh, this would be uh, where we would develop the go to definition for uh, what, yep. what Fabio was just talking about. Uh, while you're in the uh, code there of the um, uh, object definition in, in the post module. We had a quick question about annotating uh, uh, the schema with comments that then can show up in Playground. So uh, just was going to answer in text, but thought we could just do it here visually. There's a description field you can pass, um, and then this will show up in Playground. And let's try. Let's actually see it. So first, uh, we should actually get it. So this is a bit laggy. Um, looks like, yeah, there we go. <clears throat> we now have in the SDL, the fancy description. And uh, so that was on the post and the title in here, uh, we get the description as well. So hopefully cool. that answers the question. Yep. Next one from the top here, um, anonymous. Uh, person, how do you run Nexus and say a high availability load balance workload? How are do subscriptions work? So this e this answer is uh, this question is a bit easy to answer because we don't have subscriptions yet. So it's just uh, essentially stateless. It can be in many cases just stateless horizontally scaling. Right, uh, requests come in, uh, it goes to the database. Which okay, scaling problem there might might be different, but um, you can essentially just treat uh, this you could treat um, uh, the Nexus application here as like a stateless serverless deployment. Now, once we do support subscriptions, the answer is going to thicken here, uh, and the answer will vary. So, uh, not only will it vary um, in what you would do in a serverful environment, but then uh, subscriptions and horizontal scaling is also a bit of a uh, topic that just as an environment. Uh, AWS API Gateway has WebSocket support, and these provide uh, these sort of integrate with Lambdas, where you get access to um, some uh, identifiers in every Lambda invocation for the WebSocket. Uh, so they're sort of you, 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 they solve it for you basically. Um, then you could use Pusher if you're not using if you don't want to use that feature from AWS. You could maybe do something like Pusher, where they're going to provide the real time backbone, and so again, you don't have to horizontal that um, you know, do this yourself, like implement your own pub sub, uh, then it's just going to be, yeah, it's a more sophisticated topic. Um, and there's tons and tons of ways to do that. But it's kind of outside the immediate scope. Um, but again, yeah, we don't have subscriptions yet. So the answer is really easy. But but this will probably come up more. Uh, hopefully, we'll get subscriptions done next quarter. And, and then we'll start having some guides about that exact question. And, uh, you know, how, how do you scale? Uh, with subscriptions in different environments, and at least giving you different directions, links to different uh, techniques and stuff like that. All right, we're almost time, so maybe we could take one or two more questions um, from the uh, from the list here. Yep. Um, so I. Uh, I'm using VS Code, but I don't see any other type completion. Actually, there was an error on my part. Awesome. So, uh, right. like, solved. <laughs> uh, would it be fair to say that Nexus with Prisma for Studio is effectively a headless CMS? <laughs> yeah, kind of. <laughs> I mean, Studio Some people in the audience. Yeah. <laughs> Some people in the audience might be familiar with actually a tool that Fabio worked on a bit a long time ago called uh, React yeah. Admin. So, uh, and, and other people may be familiar with just the general idea of these frameworks that ship with admins like uh, Django. So, this is something that comes up from community time to time also um, as like a feature that would be nice to have. It's like, hey, can, can you make a nice like out of the box system? 
uh, for this. And certainly not in our immediate, we don't talk about this these days, like it's not on the immediate roadmap, but uh, as, as you're saying, as you're, it's like, you could kind of just cobble together for free those things and you kind of get something, I guess. Cool, uh, answered. Next question. Uh, is it a good way to use Nefsi Schema with Apollo server? And I see in the answer that someone says, Nefsi Schema will generate output uh, schema the graphical file, then you can import that into Apollo server. While that's true, um, Apollo server does not only allow uh, an SDL schema, uh, it actually also uh, allow for a, um, well, what, what Apollo has been calling an executable schema, which is like um, both the SDL representation and um, the resolver. So you can, there is a schema property that you can use to pass directly the output of made schema to Apollo server. Um, so, and to answer your question, yes, you can absolutely do so with next schema, which you cannot do for now with the framework. There is no way to switch um, express. Next question, don't know if it was already asked, but how would you manage the files for their infrastructure for a project where mutation can mutate other items in the database or has a lot of business logic? Um, Good question. Yeah, I think one, one approach to answer that would be if at some, like here we've been um, collocating mutations and queries with a type, um, what would be a much more interesting, I think on the big project is to um, collocate types and mutations per feature. Um, you can actually not only extend the query in the mutation type, but also extend pretty much any type you want. And so you could, um, yeah, split your queries by, by, by features and a feature might um, reference multiple type across your business domain. Now, if you have uh, I guess at some point some business logic that also refers to multiple types at the same time, then your best chance, I believe, is um, to externalize a lot of the business logic outside of your resolver so that you can um, reuse it uh, in different places. Do you have a better- And how about uh, one more? No, it's good, it's perfect. And like, I don't know for, for, for users who are maybe familiar with Redwood, Redwood or or something, but there's certainly frameworks out there that have some 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 very strict uh, conventions around the layout here, um, and that that help you scale. So Nexus so far hasn't built any of this in, and as the framework matures, um, we're always open to see if, if it makes sense to do so. Um, but uh, for now, it's sort of a, an open uh, like a, Nexus has no built-in opinion about this. Yeah. How about one more question, and I think we gotta we gotta end here. So, uh, all right, I have two that I, I, I can answer very quickly. I am okay. I'm seeing an error, property publish does not exist. That was um, just a problem because um, TypeScript could no longer infer um, the type of your post. Uh, that was in one of the previous chapter with the in-memory database. If you use Prisma, you will not encounter that error. Uh, it, it doesn't really answer your question greatly, but that should be enough. What about support for ARM64 devices? Uh, yeah, I think this is way out of the scope for now. I, I mean, the, the biggest bottleneck is going to be Prisma. I think uh, I don't want to throw the the rock on Prisma, but I think this is yeah the rock. Uh, I think this is where uh, you'll have um, the biggest pain, especially because uh, it's it's a native binary, and so they have to compile it. And I'm I, I'm pretty sure for now they do not compile for Raspberry Pi. Although if you look in the community, there's someone who managed to compile Prisma and make it run on the Raspberry Pi. Uh, all right, do you have time for a last proper one? Um, I can't, all right, then that's fine. Right. Let's, there's one six one left, okay. In order to make sure that you only use field defined in your database, wouldn't it make more sense to only use t.model and reserve t.field for calculated field? Yes. Intentionally, somehow, we've decided to not use t.model during um, that workshop. Um, for people who don't know, t.model is something that is brought to you by um, the Netsys plugin Prisma, and it gives you methods that will map your database fields onto your GraphQL schema. And what this enables you to do is to safely um, do the mapping so that if you have migrations, for instance, where you rename fields, 
where the, the name of the method is going to change. And so the mapping will break. And it's great because it's going to break at compile time. And you won't have, um, you, you won't have to be concerned about uh, making sure that your database and your GraphQL schema are, are always in sync. The type teams will tell you when, when, when that's uh, breaking. Uh, we haven't talked about that because um, we wanted to use Nexus um, in, in, in the raw way as much as possible. Uh, but feel free to check out the documentation about it. Um, it's super easy to use, especially the TDF model. Then the second question is, can you talk about date time and JSON type? I had some issues recently when defining Rs before resolver. All right, there's quite a lot of question uh, about date time and JSON. Uh, as I said, it's now built in by default, so you can use TDF JSON and TDF dates. Yep. And One thing I can add on about the JSON is that it's a JSON object, so we call it yep. JSON, but it won't support arrays. It won't like root level arrays. It won't support root level strings and booleans and nulls. Uh, so it's sort of a subset technically of JSON, JSON objects, but then you've got the full power once you're inside of an object. Yeah. All right, that was the last one. Um, sorry for being so late. Thank you so much, I guess, for staying with us. Um, it's been now three hours. Um, please, please, please fill in uh, the feedback. We, we're super um, curious to hear about your feedback and what you've been thinking of it. Jason, do you have anything else you would like to add? Um, well, it's been a lot of fun. I hope it was fun for you guys. Um, and we'll totally, hopefully, do this again. Uh, not, not just until next Prisma Day, a year from now, but uh, maybe along the line. Um, maybe uh, we were doing uh, sprints at videos every sprint uh, in Q1 this year, and um, maybe maybe we won't do that exactly, but maybe on some big releases like subscriptions or, or something, we'll we'll do some some nice videos. So, but your feedback is would be super 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 uh, welcomed and uh, allow us to kind of improve how we do this in the future. And uh, Fabian, huge thanks for driving this workshop, man. You you did amazing. So. Um, to the last questions, I'll, uh, I'll try to uh, get back to you guys, uh, maybe on our Slack community or something. Um, but uh, yeah, it's just been a lot of fun, so thanks. Yeah, thanks for answering uh, 50 questions. <laughs> <laughs> All right, everyone, Bye, everyone, have a nice evening, day or uh, afternoon. Bye. Bye.